Classic Tales of Horror, read by Patrick Malahide. The Monkey's Paw, by W. W. Jacobs. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlour of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. "'Ach, at the wind!' said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. "'I'm listening,' said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. "'Check!' "'I should hardly think he'd come tonight,' said his father, with his hand poised over the board. "'Mate,' replied the son. "'Well, that's the worst of living so far out,' bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked-for violence. "'Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live, this is the worst. "'Paths are bog and the roads are torrent. "'I don't know what people are thinking about. "'I suppose because only two houses in the road are let, they think it doesn't matter.' "'Never mind, dear.' said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin grey beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came towards the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, "'Tut, tut,' and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. "'Sergeant Major Morris,' he said, introducing him. The Sergeant Major shook hands and, taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whisky and tumblers, and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair, and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues, of strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it!' said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. Well, he don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White, politely. Well, I like to go to India myself, said the old man. Uh, just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and, sighing softly, shook it again. Oh, I should like to see those old temples and, and fakers and, and, and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you started telling me the other day about a, a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing, said the soldier hastily. At least there is nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? said Mrs. White curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major off-handedly. His three listeners leant forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. "'To look at,' said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket, "'it's just an ordinary little paw, dried to mummy.' He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. "'And what is the special about it?' inquired Mr. White, as he took it from his son, and, having examined it, placed it upon the table. "'It had a spell put on it by an old fakir,' said the sergeant-major. "'A very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it.' His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. "'Well, why don't you have three, sir?' said Herbert White cleverly. 
The soldier regarded him in the way that Middle Ages wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? asked Mrs. White. I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? persisted the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the poor. His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. Well, if you've had your free wishes, it's no good to you now, then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It's caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them. And those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. Well, if you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly. Would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw, and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. Why, if you don't want it, Morris, said the other, well, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? he inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Oh, sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket and then all three burst into laughter, as the sergeant-major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. "'If you must wish,' he said gruffly, "'wish for something sensible.' Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket, and, placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second instalment of the soldier's adventures in India. Oh, if the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he's been telling us, said Herbert as the door closed behind their guest just in time to catch the last train, oh, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give him anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. Well, um, a trifle, said he, colouring slightly. But he didn't want it, but I, I made him take it, and he, he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely said Herbert, with pretended horror. Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. I wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with, and then you can't be henpecked. He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White, armed with an antimacassar. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. Seems to me I've, I've got all I want. Well, if you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it, it twisted in my hand like, like a snake. Oh, well, I don't see the money, said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table, and I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, father, said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Well, never mind, though. There's no harm done, but it gave me a shock all the same. 
They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. "'I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed,' said Herbert as he bade them good night, "'and something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains.' He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that with a little uneasy laugh he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. "'I suppose all old soldiers are the same,' said Mrs. White. "'The idea of our listening to such nonsense!' How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt your father? Might drop on his head from the sky, said the frivolous Herbert. Morris said the things happen so naturally, said his father, that you, you might, if you so wish, attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back, said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. "'Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home,' she said, as they sat at dinner. "'I dare say,' said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. "'But for all that, the thing moved in my hand that I'll swear to.' "'You thought it did,' said the old lady soothingly. "'I say it did,' replied the other. "'There was no thought about it. I just... "'What's the matter?' "'His wife made no reply.' She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the two hundred pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it and then, with sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White, at the same moment, placed her hands behind her and, hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologised for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden, she then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. "'I was asked to call,' he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. "'I come from Moore and Meggins.' The old lady started. "'Is anything the matter?' she asked breathlessly. Uh, "'Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it?' "'What is it?' her husband interposed. "'There, there, mother,' he said hastily. "'Sit down. Don't jump to conclusions. "'You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir.' "'And he eyed the other wistfully. "'I'm sorry,' began the visitor. Well, "'Is he hurt?' demanded the mother wildly. "'The visitor bowed in assent. "'Badly hurt,' he said quietly. "'But... He is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank... 
she broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It, it's hard. The other coughed and, rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you and your great loss, he said without looking round. I beg that you will understand that I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Moore and Meggins disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a, a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand, and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to the house, steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realise it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load, too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectation gave place to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You'll be cold. It's colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, and then slept, until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. "'The poor!' she cried wildly. "'The monk is poor!' He started up in alarm. "'Where? Where is it? What's the matter?' She came stumbling across the room toward him. "'I want it,' she said quietly. "'You've not destroyed it?' Well, "'It's in the parlour, on the bracket,' he replied, marvelling. "'Why?' She cried and laughed together and, bending over, kissed his cheek. "'I only just thought of it,' she said hysterically. "'Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it?' "'Think of what?' he questioned. "'The other two wishes,' she replied rapidly. "'We've only had one.' "'Was not that enough?' he demanded fiercely. "'No!' she cried triumphantly. "'We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly, and wish our boy alive again.' The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. "'Good God, you're mad!' he cried, aghast. "'Get it!' she panted. "'Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy!' Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. "'Get back to bed!' 
he said unsteadily. You, you don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Well, why not the second? A, a coincidence, stammered the old man. Go and get it a wish, cried his wife, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He, he's been dead ten days, and besides, I'd not tell you else, but I could, I could only recognise him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I've nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlour, and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath as he found that he'd lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself on the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It's foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and he paused to strike another. And at the same moment a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. "'What's that?' cried the old woman, starting up. "'A rat,' said the old man in shaking tones. "'A rat! He passed me on the stairs.' His wife sat up in bed listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. "'It's Herbert!' she screamed. "'It's Herbert!' She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and, catching her by the arm, held her tightly. "'What are you going to do?' he whispered hoarsely. "'It's my boy! It's Herbert!' she cried, struggling mechanically. "'I forgot! It was two miles away! What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door! For God's sake, don't let it in!' cried the old man, trembling. "'You're afraid of your own son!' she cried, struggling. "'Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert! I'm coming!' There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing, and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back, and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice strained and panting. "'The bolt!' she cried loudly. "'Come down! I can't reach it!' 
but her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. Timber by John Galsworthy Sir Arthur Hirries, baronet of Hirrihuch in a northern county, came to the decision to sell his timber in that state of mind, common during the war, which may be called patrio-profiteering. Like newspaper proprietors, writers on strategy, shipbuilders, owners of works, makers of arms, and the rest of the working classes at large, his mood was... Let me serve my country, and if thereby my profits are increased, well, let me put up with it and invest in national bonds. With an encumbered estate and some of the best coverts in that northern county, it had not become practical politics to sell his timber till the government wanted it at all costs. To let's his shooting had been more profitable till now, when a patriotic action and a stroke of business had become synonymous. A man of sixty-five, but not yet grey, with a reddish tinge in his moustache, cheeks, lips and eyelids, slightly knock-kneed and with large, rather spreading feet, he moved in the best circles in a somewhat embarrassed manner. At the enhanced price, the timber at Hirrihuch would enfranchise him for the remainder of his days. He sold it, therefore, one day of April, when the war news was bad, to a government official on the spot. He sold it at half-past five in the afternoon, practically for cash down, and drank a stiff whisky and soda to wash away the taste of the transaction. For, though no sentimentalist, his great-great-grandfather had planted most of it, and his grandfather the rest. Royalty, too, had shot there in its time, and he himself, never much of a sportsman, had missed more birds in the rides and hollows of his fine coverts than he cared to remember. But the country was in need, and the price considerable. Bidding the government official good-bye, he lighted a cigar, and went across the park to take a farewell stroll among his timber. He entered the home covert by a path leading through a group of pear trees just coming into bloom. Smoking cigars and drinking whisky in the afternoon in preference to tea, Sir Arthur Hirries had not much sense of natural beauty. But those pear trees impressed him, greenish-white against blue sky and fleecy thick clouds, which looked as if they had snow in them. They were deuced pretty, and promised a good year for fruit, if they escaped the late frosts, though it certainly looked like freezing tonight. He paused a moment at the wicket-gate to glance back at them, like scantily clothed maidens posing on the outskirts of his timber. Such, however, was not the vision of Sir Arthur Hirries, who was considering how he should invest the balance of the cash down after paying off his mortgages. National bonds. The country was in need. Passing through the gate, he entered the ride of the home covert. Variety lay like colour on his woods. They stretched for miles, and his ancestors had planted almost every kind of tree, beech, oak, birch, Sycamore, ash, elm, hazel, holly, pine, a lime tree and a hornbeam here and there, and further in among the winding coverts, spinneys and belts of larch. The evening air was sharp, and sleet showers came whirling from those bright clouds. He walked briskly, drawing at his richly fragrant cigar, the whisky still warm within him. He walked, thinking with a gentle melancholy, slowly turning a little sulky, 
that he would never again be pointing out with his shooting stick to such a guest where he was to stand to get the best birds over him. The pheasants had been let down during the war, but he put up two or three old cocks who went clattering and whirring out to left and right, and rabbits crossed the rides quietly to and fro within easy shot. He came to where royalty had stood fifteen years ago during the last drive. He remembered royalty saying, "'A very pretty shooting of that last stand here is birds just about as high as I like them.' The ground indeed rose rather steeply there, and the timber was oak and ash, with a few dark pines sprinkled into the bare greyish twiggery of the oaks, always costive in spring, and the just greening feather of the ashes. Well, they'll be cutting those pines first, he thought, strapping trees, straight as the lines of Euclid, and free of branches save at their tops. In the brisk wind those tops swayed a little, and gave forth soft complaint. Oh, three times my age, he thought, prime timber. The ride wound sharply and entered a belt of larch, whose steep rise entirely barred off the rather sinister sunset. A dark and wistful wood, delicate, dun and grey, whose green shoots and crimson tips would have perfumed the evening coolness, but for the cigar smoke in his nostrils. Oh, they'll have uh, this spinney for pit props, he thought, and taking a cross ride through it, he emerged in a heathery glen of birch trees. No forester, he wondered if they'd make anything of those whitened, glistening shapes. His cigar had gone out now, and he leant against one of the satin-smooth stems, under the lacery of twig and bud, sheltering the flame of a relighting match. A hare hopped away among the bilberry shoots. A jay, painted like a fan, squawked and flustered past him up the glen. Interested in birds, and wanting just one more jay to complete a fine stuffed group of them, Sir Arthur, though devoid of a gun, followed, to see where the beggar's nest was. The glen dipped rapidly, and the character of the timber changed, assuming greater girth and solidity. There was a lot of beech here, a bit he did not know, for though taken in by the beaters, no guns could be stationed there because of the lack of undergrowth. The jay had vanished, and light had begun to fail. Well, I must get back, he thought, or I shall be late for dinner. He debated for a moment whether to retrace his steps, or to cut across the beaches and regain the home covered by a loop. The jay, reappearing to the left, decided him to cross the beech grove. He did so, and took a narrow ride up through a dark bit of mixed timber with heavy undergrowth. The ride, after favouring the left for a little, bent away to the right. Sir Arthur followed it hurriedly, conscious that twilight was gathering fast. It must bend again to the left in a minute. It did, and then to the right, and the undergrowth remaining thick he could only follow on, or else retrace his steps. He followed on, beginning to get hot in spite of a sleet shower falling through the dusk. He was not framed by nature for swift travelling, his knees turning in and his toes turning out, but he went at a good bat, uncomfortably aware that the ride was still taking him away from home, and expecting it at any minute to turn left again. It did not, and hot, out of breath, a little bewildered, he stood still in three-quarter darkness to listen. Not a sound, save that of wind in the tops of the trees, and a faint creaking of timber, where two stems had grown athwart and were touching. The path was a regular will-o'-the-wisp. He must make a bee-line of it through the undergrowth into another ride. He had never before been amongst his timber in the dusk, and he found the shapes of the confounded trees more weird and more menacing than he never dreamed of. He stumbled quickly on, in and out of them among the undergrowth, without coming to a ride. Well, here I am, stuck in this damned wood, he thought. To call these formidably encircling shapes a wood gave him relief. After all, it was his wood, and nothing very untoward could happen to a man in his own wood, however dark it might get. He could not be more than a mile and a half of the outside from his dining room. He looked at his watch, whose hands he could just see. Nearly half-past seven. The sleet had become snow, 
but it hardly fell on him, so thick was the timber just here. But he had no overcoat, and suddenly he felt that first sickening little drop in his chest, which presages alarm. Nobody knew he was in this damned wood, and in a quarter of an hour it would be as black as your hat. He must get on and out. The trees amongst which he was stumbling produced quite a sick feeling now in one who hitherto had never taken trees seriously. What monstrous growth they were! The thought that seeds, tiny seeds or saplings planted by his ancestors, could attain such huge, impending and imprisoning bulk, ghostly great growths mounting up to heaven and shutting off this world, exasperated and unnerved him. He began to run, caught his foot in a root and fell flat on his face. The cursed trees seemed to have a down on him. Rubbing elbows and forehead with his snow-wetted hands, he leant against a trunk to get his breath and summon the sense of direction to his brain. Once, as a young man, he had been bushed at night in Vancouver Island. Quite a scary business. But he'd come out all right, though his camp had been the only civilised spot within a radius of twenty miles. And here he was, on his own estate, within a mile or two of home, getting into a funk. It was childish. And he laughed. The wind answered, sighing and threshing in the treetops. There must be a regular blizzard blowing now, and to judge by the cold from the north, but whether northeast or northwest was the question. Besides, how to keep a definite direction without a compass in the dark? The timber, too, with its thick trunks, diverted the wind into keen, directionless draughts. He looked up, but could make nothing of the two or three stars that he could see. It was a mess. Daddy lighted a second cigar with some difficulty, for he'd begun to shiver. The wind in this blasted wood cut through his Norfolk jacket and crawled about his body, which had become hot from exertions and now felt clammy and half-frozen. Oh, this would mean pneumonia if he didn't look out. And half-feeling his way from trunk to trunk, he started on again, but for all he could tell he might be going round in a circle, might even be crossing rides without realising... And again that sickening drop occurred in his chest. He stood still and shouted. He had the feeling of shouting into walls of timber, dark and heavy, which threw the sound back at him. Curse you, he thought. I wish I'd sold you six months ago. The wind fleered and mowed in the treetops, and he started off again at a run in that dark wilderness till, hitting his head against a low branch, he fell, stunned. He lay several minutes unconscious, came to himself deadly cold, and struggled up onto his feet. "'By Jove!' he thought, with a sort of stammer in his brain. "'This is a bad business. I, I may be out here all night.' For an unimaginative man, it was extraordinary what vivid images he had just then. He saw the face of the government official who had bought his timber, and the slight grimace with which he had agreed to the price. He saw his butler, after the gong had gone, standing like a stuck pig by the sideboard, waiting for him to come down. What would they do when he didn't come? Would they have the nous to imagine that he might have lost his way in the coverts, and take lanterns and search for him? Far more likely they'd think he'd walked over to Greenlands or Berry Moor and stayed there to dinner. And suddenly he saw himself slowly freezing out here in the snowy night among this cursed timber. With a vigorous shake he butted again into the darkness among the tree trunks. He was angry now, with himself, with the night, with the trees. So angry that he actually let out with his fist at a trunk against which he had stumbled and scored his knuckles. It was humiliating, and Sir Arthur Hirries was not accustomed to humiliation. In anybody else's wood, yes, but to be lost like this in one's own coverts. Well, if he had to walk all night, he would get out, and he plunged on doggedly in the darkness. He was fighting with his timber now, as if the thing were alive, and each tree an enemy. In the interminable stumbling exertion of that groping progress, his angry mood gave place to half-comatose philosophy. Trees... His great-great-grandfather had planted them. His own 
was the fifth man's life, but the trees were almost as young as ever. They made nothing of a man's life. He sniggered. <laughs> and a man made nothing of theirs. Did they know they were going to be cut down? All the better if they did, and were sweating in their shoes. He pinched himself. His thoughts were becoming so queer. He remembered that once, when his liver was out of order, trees had seemed to him like solid, tall diseases, bulbous, scarred, cavernous, witch-armed, fungoid emanations of the earth. Well, so they were, and he was among them, on a snowy pitch-black night, engaged in this death struggle. The occurrence of the word death in his thoughts brought him up all standing. Why couldn't he concentrate his mind on getting out? Why was he mooning about the life and nature of trees instead of trying to remember the confirmation of his covets so as to rekindle in himself some sense of general direction? He struck a number of matches to get a sight of his watch again. Great heaven, he'd been walking nearly two hours since he last looked at it. And in what direction? They said a man in fog went round and round because of some kink in his brain. He began now to feel the trees, searching for a hollow trunk. A hollow would be some protection from the cold, his first conscious confession of exhaustion. He was not in training, and he was sixty-five. The thought, I can't keep this up much longer, caused a second explosion of sullen anger. Damnation! Here he was, for all he could tell, standing where he'd sat perhaps a dozen times on his spread shooting stick, watching sunlight on bare twigs or the nose of his spaniel twitching beside him, listening to the tap of the beater's sticks and the shrill, drawn-out, Mark, cockover! Would they let the dogs out to pick up his tracks? No. Ten to one they would assume he was staying the night at the Summertons or at Lady Mary's, as he'd done before now, after dining there. And suddenly his strained heart leapt. He had struck a ride again, his mind slipped back into place like an elastic let-go, relaxed, quivering gratefully. He'd only to follow this ride, and somewhere, somehow, he would come out. And be hanged if he'd let them know what a fool he'd made of himself. Right or left? Which way? He turned so that the flying snow came on his back, hurrying forward between the denser darkness on either hand, where the timber stood in walls, moving his arms across and across his body as if dragging a concertina to full stretch to make sure that he was keeping in the path. He went what seemed an interminable way like this till he was brought up all standing by trees and could find no outlet, no continuation. Turning in his tracks, with the snow in his face now, he retraced his steps till once more he was brought up short by trees. He stood panting. It was ghastly, ghastly, and in a panic he dived this way and that to find the bend, the turning, the way on. The sleet stung his eyes, the wind fleered and whistled, the boughs sloughed and moaned. He struck matches, trying to shade them with his cold, wet hands, but one by one they went out, and still he found no turning. The ride must have a blind alley at either end, the turning be down the side somewhere. Hope revived in him. Never say die. He began a second retracing of his steps, feeling the trunks along one side to find a gap. His breath came with difficulty. What would old Broadley say if he could see him, soaked, frozen, tired to death, stumbling along in the darkness among this cursed timber? Old Broadley, who had told him his heart was in poor case. A gap! Ah! No trunks! A ride at last! He turned, felt a sharp pain in his knee, and pitched forward. He could not rise. The knee, dislocated six years ago, was out again. Sir Arthur Hiddies clenched his teeth. Nothing more could happen to him. But after a minute, blank and bitter, he began to crawl along the new ride. Oddly, he felt less discouraged and alarmed on hands and knee, for he could use but one. It was a relief to have his eyes fixed on the ground, not peering at the tree trunks, or perhaps there was less strain for the moment on his heart. 
He crawled, stopping every minute or so to renew his strength. He crawled mechanically, waiting for his heart, his knee, his lungs to stop him. The earth was snowed over, and he could feel its cold wetness as he scraped along. Good tracks to follow, if anybody struck them. But in this dark forest, in one of his halts, drying his hands as best he could, he struck a match, and sheltering it desperately, fumbled out his watch. Past ten o'clock. He wound the watch and put it back against his heart. If only he could wind his heart. And squatting there, he counted his matches. Four. Well, he thought grimly, I won't like them to show me my blasted trees. I've got a cigar left. I'll keep them for that. And he crawled on again. He must keep going while he could. He crawled till his heart and lungs and knee struck work, and leaning his back against a tree, sat huddled together so exhausted that he felt nothing save a sort of bitter heartache. He even dropped asleep, waking with a shudder, dragged from a dream armchair at the club into this cold, wet darkness and the blizzard moaning in the trees. He tried to crawl again, but could not, and for some minutes stayed motionless, hugging his body with his arms. Well, he thought vaguely, I have done it. His mind was in such lethargy that he could not even pity himself. His matches. Could he make a fire? But he was no woodsman, and though he groped around, could find no fuel that was not soaking wet. He scraped a hole and, with what papers he had in his pockets, tried to kindle the wet wood. No good. He had only two matches left now, and he remembered his cigar. He took it out, bit the end off, and began with infinite precautions to prepare for lighting it. The first burned, and the cigar drew. He had one match left, in case he dozed and let the thing go out. Looking up through the blackness, he could see a star. He fixed his eyes on it, and leaning against the trunk, drew the smoke down into his lungs. With his arms crossed tightly on his breast, he smoked very slowly. When it was finished, what? Cold, and the wind in the trees until the morning. Halfway through the cigar, he dozed off, slept a long time, and woke up so cold that he could barely summon vitality enough to strike his last match. By some miracle it burned, and he got his cigar to draw again. This time he smoked it nearly to its end, without mentality, almost without feeling, except the physical sense of bitter cold. Once, with a sudden clearing of the brain, he thought faintly, "'Oh, thank God I sow the trees!' and then all come down. The thought drifted away in frozen incoherence, drifted out like his cigar smoke into the sleet, and with a faint grin on his lips, he dozed off again. An underkeeper found him at ten o'clock next morning, blue from cold, under a tall elm tree, within a mile of his bed, one leg stretched out, the other hunched up towards his chest, with its foot dug into the undergrowth for warmth, his head cuddled into the collar of his coat, his arms crossed on his breast. They said he must have been dead at least five hours. Along one side snow had drifted against him, but the trunk had saved his back and other side. Above him the spindly top boughs of that tall tree were covered with green-gold clusters of tiny crinkled elm flowers against a deep blue sky, gay as a song of perfect praise. The wind had dropped, and after the cold of the night the birds were singing their clearest in the sunshine. They did not cut down the elm tree under which they found his body with the rest of the sold timber, but put a little iron fence round it, and a little tablet on its trunk. That's the end of side one. The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe.
The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatori, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose colour varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the colour of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood colour. Now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod, bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass, and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, 
the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered, that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang, and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled, as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colours and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric lustre. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen since in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms, and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet, and then for a moment all is still, and all is silent save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away, they have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many-tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-coloured panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. 
and the revel went whirlingly on until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure, which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumour of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had out-heroded Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion, even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revellers around, but the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who oh, dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and, while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centres of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, 
that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revellers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave sediments and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revellers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness, and decay, and the red death, held illimitable dominion over all. The Score by Bram Stoker Nuremberg at the time was not so much exploited as it has been since then, Irving had not been playing Faust, and the very name of the old town was hardly known to the great bulk of the travelling public. My wife and I, being in the second week of our honeymoon, naturally wanted someone else to join our party, so that when the cheery stranger Elias P. Hutchison, hailing from Isthmian City, Bleeding Gulch, Maple Tree, County, Nebraska, turned up at the station at Frankfurt, and casually remarked that he was going on to see the most all fired old Methuselah of a town in Europe, and that he guessed that so much travelling alone was enough to send an intelligent, active citizen into the melancholy ward of a daft house, we took the pretty broad hint and suggested that we should join forces. We found, on comparing notes afterwards, that we had each intended to speak with some diffidence or hesitation, so as not to appear too eager, such not being a good compliment to the success of our married life. But the effect was entirely marred by our both beginning to speak at the same instant, stopping simultaneously, and then going on together again. Anyhow, no matter how it was done, and Elias P. Hutchison became one of our party. Straightway, Amelia and I found a pleasant benefit. Instead of quarrelling as we had been doing, we found that the restraining influence of a third party was such that we now took every opportunity of spooning in odd corners. Amelia declares that ever since she has, as the result of that experience, advised all her friends to take a friend on the honeymoon. Well, we did Nordenberg together, and much enjoyed the racy remarks of our transatlantic friend, who, from his quaint speech and his wonderful stock of adventures, might have stepped out of a novel. We kept for the last object of interest in the city to be visited, the Burg, and on the day appointed for the visit, strolled round the outer wall of the city by the eastern side. The Burg is seated on a rock dominating the town, and an immensely deep fosse guards it on the northern side. Nuremberg has been happy in that it was never sacked. Uh, had it been, it would certainly not be so spick and span perfect as it is at present. The ditch has not been used for centuries, and now its base is spread with tea gardens and orchards, of which some of the trees are of quite respectable growth. As we wandered round the wall, dawdling in the hot July sunshine, we often paused to admire the views spread before us, and in especial the great plain covered with towns and villages and bounded with a blue line of hills like a landscape of Claude Lorraine.
From this we always turned with new delight to the city itself, with its myriad of quaint old gables and acre-wide red roofs dotted with dormer windows, tier upon tier. A little to our right rose the towers of the Bourg, and nearer still, standing grim, the Torture Tower, which was, and is perhaps, the most interesting place in the city. For centuries the tradition of the Iron Virgin of Nuremberg has been handed down as an instance of the horrors of cruelty of which man is capable. We had long looked forward to seeing it, and here at last was its home. In one of our pauses we leaned over the wall of a moat and looked down. The garden seemed quite fifty or sixty feet below us, and the sun pouring into it with an intense, moveless heat like that of an oven. Beyond rose the grey, grim wall, seemingly of endless height, and losing itself right and left in the angles of bastion and counterscarp. Trees and bushes crowned the wall, and above again towered the lofty houses on whose massive beauty time has only set the hand of approval. The sun was hot, and we were lazy. Time was our own, and we lingered, leaning on the wall. Just below us was a pretty sight. A great black cat lying stretched in the sun, whilst round her gambled prettily a tiny black kitten. The mother would wave her tail for the kitten to play with, or would raise her feet and push away the little one as an encouragement to further play. They were just at the foot of the wall, and Elias P. Hutchison, in order to help the play, stooped and took from the walk a moderate-sized pebble. See, he said, I'll drop it near the kitten. They'll both wonder where it came from. Oh, be careful, said my wife. You might hit the dear little thing. Not me, ma'am, said Elias P. Why, I'm as tender as a main cherry tree. Lord bless you, I wouldn't hurt a poor pretty little creature more than I'd scalp a baby, and you may bet your variegated socks on that. See, I'll drop it fur away on the outside so as not to go near her. Thus saying, he leaned over and held his arm out at full length and dropped the stone. It may be that there is some attractive force which draws lesser matters to greater, or more probably that the wall was not plumb but sloped to its base, we not noticing the inclination from above, but the stone fell with a sickening thud that came up to us through the hot air, right on the kitten's head, and shattered out its little brains then and there. The black cat cast a swift upward glance, and we saw her eyes like green fire fixed an instant on Elias P. Hutchison. And then her attention was given to the kitten, which lay still with just a quiver of her tiny limbs, whilst a thin red stream trickled from a gaping wound. With a muffled cry such as a human being might give, she bent over the kitten, licking its wound and moaning. Suddenly she seemed to realize that it was dead, and again threw her eyes up at us. I shall never forget the sight, for she looked the perfect incarnation of hate. Her green eyes blazed with lurid fire, and the white, sharp teeth seemed to almost shine through the blood which dabbled her mouth and whiskers. She gnashed her teeth, and her claws stood out stark and at full length on every paw. Then she made a wild rush up the wall as if to reach us, but when the momentum ended fell back and further added to her horrible appearance, for she fell on the kitten and rose with her black fur smeared with its brains and blood. Amelia turned quite faint, and I had to lift her back from the wall, there was a seat close by in shade of a spreading plane tree, and here I placed her whilst she composed herself. Then I went back to Hutchison, who stood without moving, looking down on the angry cat below. As I joined him, he said, Well, I guess that there's the savagest beast I ever see, except once, when an Apache squaw had an edge on a half-breed, what they nicknamed Splinters, because of the way he fixed up her papoose, which he stole on a raid just to show that he appreciated the way he'd given his mother the fire torture. 
She got that kind of look so set on her face it just seemed to grow there. She followed Splinters more than three years till at last the Braves got him and handed him over to her. They did say that no man white or Injun had ever been so long a dying under the tortures of the Apaches. The only time I ever see her smile was when I wiped her out. I came on to camp just in time to see Splinters passing his checks, and he wasn't sorry to go either. He was a hard citizen, although I never could shake with him after that papoose business, for it was bitter bad, and he should have been a white man, for he looked like one I see he'd got paid out in full. Durn me, but I took a piece of his hide from one of his skinning posts and had it made into a pocketbook. It's here now. And he slapped the breast pocket of his coat. Whilst he was speaking, the cat was continuing her frantic efforts to get up the wall. She would take a run back and then charge up, sometimes reaching an incredible height. She did not seem to mind the heavy fall which she got each time, but started with renewed vigour, and at every tumble her appearance became more horrible. Hutchison was a, a kind-hearted man. My wife and I had both noticed little acts of kindness to animals as well as to persons, and he seemed concerned at the state of fury to which the cat had wrought herself. "'Well, now,' he said, "'I do declare that poor critter seemed quite desperate. "'There, there, poor thing, it was all an accident, "'though that won't bring back your little one to you. "'Say I wouldn't have had such a thing happen for a thousand. It "'Just shows what a clumsy fool of a man can do when he tries to play.' Seems I'm too darn slipper-handed to even play with a cat. Say, Colonel, it was a pleasant way he had to bestow titles freely. I hope your wife don't hold no grudge against me on account of this unpleasantness. Why, I wouldn't have had it occur on no account. He came over to Amelia and apologized profusely, and she, with her usual kindness of heart, hastened to assure him that she quite understood that it was an accident. And then we all went again to the war and looked over. The cat, missing Hutchison's face, had drawn back across the moat, and was sitting on her haunches as though ready to spring. Indeed, the very instant she saw him she did spring, and with a blind, unreasoning fury, which would have been grotesque, only that it was so frightfully real. She did not try to run up the wall, but simply launched herself at him as though hate and fury could lend her wings to pass straight through the great distance between them. Amelia, woman-like, got quite concerned and said to Elias P. in a warning voice, "'Oh, you must be very careful. That animal would try to kill you if she were here. Her eyes looked like positive murder.' He laughed out jovially. "'Excuse me, ma'am,' he said, "'but I can't help laughing.' "'Fancy a man that's fought grizzlies and engines "'being careful of being murdered by a cat.' "'When the cat heard him laugh, "'her whole demeanour seemed to change. "'She no longer tried to jump or run up the wall, "'but went quietly over, "'and sitting again beside the dead kitten, "'began to lick and fondle it as though it were alive. "'Oh, see,' said I, "'the effect of a really strong man.' Even that animal, in the midst of her fury, recognises the voice of a master, and bows to him. "'Like a squaw,' was the only comment of Elias P. Hutchison, as we moved on our way round the city foss. Every now and then we looked over the wall, and each time saw the cat following us. At first she'd kept going back to the dead kitten, and then, as the distance grew greater, took it in her mouth, and so followed. After a while, however, she abandoned this, for we saw her following all alone. She'd evidently hidden the body somewhere. Amelia's alarm grew at the cat's persistence, and more than once she repeated her warning. But the American always laughed with amusement, till finally, seeing that she was beginning to be worried, he said... "'I say, ma'am, you needn't be scared over that cat. "'I go healed, I do.' "'Here he slapped his pistol pocket at the back of his lumbar region. "'Why, sooner than have you word, I'll shoot the critter right here "'and risk the police interfering with a citizen of the United States "'for carrying arms contrary to regulations.' "'As he spoke, he looked over the wall, "'but the cat, on seeing him, retreated with a growl "'into a bed of tall flowers and was hidden.' He went on, blessed if that her creature ain't got more sense of what's good for it than most Christians. I guess we've seen the last of her. You bet you go back now to that busted kitten and have a private funeral of it all to herself. 
Amelia did not like to say more, lest he might, in mistaken kindness to her, fulfil his threat of shooting the cat. And so we went on, and crossed the little wooden bridge leading to the gateway, whence ran the steep paved roadway between the Bourg and the pentagonal torture tower. As we crossed the bridge, we saw the cat again down below us. When she saw us, her fury seemed to return, and she made frantic efforts to get up the steep wall. Hutchison laughed as he looked down at her and said, "'Goodbye, old girl. Sorry I injured your feelings, but you'll get over it in time. So long!' And then we passed through the long, dim archway and came to the gate of the Bourg. When we came out again after our survey of this most beautiful old place, which not even the well-intentioned efforts of the Gothic restorers of forty years ago have been able to spoil, though their restoration was then glaring white, we seem to have quite forgotten the unpleasant episode of the morning. The old lime-tree, with its great trunk gnarled with a passing of nearly nine centuries, the deep well cut through the heart of the rock by those captors of old, and the lovely view from the city wall, whence we heard, spread over almost a full quarter of an hour the multitudinous chimes of the city, had all helped to wipe out from our minds the incident of the slain kitten. We were the only visitors who had entered the torture tower that morning, so at least said the old custodian, and, as we had the place all to ourselves, were able to make a minute and more satisfactory survey than would have otherwise been possible. The custodian, looking to us as the sole source of his gains for the day, was willing to meet our wishes in any way. The torture tower is truly a grim place. Even now, when many thousands of visitors have sent a stream of life and the joy that follows life into the place, but at the time I mention, it wore its grimmest and most gruesome aspect. The dust of ages seemed to have settled on it, and the darkness and the horror of its memories seem to have become sentient in a way that would have satisfied the pantheistic souls of Philo or Spinoza. The lower chamber where we entered was, seemingly in its normal state, filled with incarnate darkness. Even the hot sunlight streaming in through the door seemed to be lost in the vast thickness of the walls, not only showed the masonry rough as when the builder's scaffolding had come down, but coated with dust and marked here and there with patches of dark stain, which, if walls could speak, could have given their own dread memories of fear and pain. We were glad to pass up the dusty wooden staircase, the custodian leaving the outer door open to light us somewhat on our way, for to our eyes the one long-wicked evil-smelling candle stuck in a sconce on the wall gave an inadequate light. When we came up through the open trap in the corner of the chamber overhead, Amelia held on to me so tightly that I could actually feel her heart beat. I must say for my own part that I was not surprised at her fear, for this room was even more gruesome than that below. Here there was certainly more light, but only just sufficient to realise the horrible surroundings of the place. The builders of the tower had evidently intended that only they who should gain the top should have any of the joys of light and prospect. There, as we had noticed from below, were ranges of windows, albeit of medieval smallness, but elsewhere in the tower were only a very few narrow slits, such as were habitual in places of medieval defence. A few of these only lit the chamber, and these so high up in the wall that from no part could the sky be seen through the thickness of the walls. In racks, and leaning in disorder against the walls, were a number of headsmen's swords, great double-handed weapons with broad blade and keen edge. Hard by were several blocks, where on the necks of the victims had lain, with here and there deep notches where the steel had bitten through the guard of flesh and shored into the wood. Round the chamber, placed in all sorts of irregular ways, were many implements of torture which made one's heart ache to see. Chairs full of spikes which gave instant and excruciating pain. Chairs and couches with dull knobs whose torture was seemingly less, but which, though slower, were equally efficacious. Racks, belts, boots, gloves, collars, 
all made for compressing at will, steel baskets in which the head could be slowly crushed into a pulp if necessary, watchman's hooks with long handle and knife that cut at resistance, this a specialty of the old Nuremberg police system, and many, many other devices for man's injury to man. Amelia grew quite pale with the horror of the things, but fortunately did not faint, for being a little overcome, she sat down on a tortured chair, but jumped up again with a shriek, all tendency to faint gone. We both pretended that it was the injury done to her dress by the dust of the chair and the rusty spikes which had upset her, and Mr. Hutchison acquiesced in accepting the explanation with a kind-hearted laugh. But the central object in the whole of this chamber of horrors was the engine known as the Iron Virgin, which stood near the centre of the room. It was a rudely shaped figure of a woman, something of the bell order, or, to make a closer comparison, of the figure of Mrs. Noah in the children's ark, but without that slimness of waist and perfect rondeur of hip which marks the aesthetic type of the Noah family. One would hardly have recognised it as intended for a human figure at all, had not the founder shaped on the forehead a rude semblance of a woman's face. This machine was coated with rust without and covered with dust. A rope was fastened to a ring in the front of the figure, about where the waist should have been, and was drawn through a pulley, fastened on the wooden pillar which sustained the flooring above. The custodian, pulling this rope, showed that a section of the front was hinged like a door at one side. We then saw that the engine was of considerable thickness, leaving just room enough inside for a man to be placed. The door was of equal thickness and of great weight, for it took the custodian all his strength, aided though he was by the contrivance of the pulley, to open it. This weight was partly due to the fact that the door was of manifest purpose, hung so as to throw its weight downwards, so that it might shut of its own accord when the strain was released. The inside was honeycombed with rust, nay, more, the rust alone that comes through time would hardly have eaten so deep into the iron walls. The rust of the cruel stains was deep indeed. It was only, however, when we came to look at the inside of the door that the diabolical intention was manifest to the full. Here were several long spikes, square and massive, broad at the base and sharp at the points, placed in such a position that when the door should close, the upper ones would pierce the eyes of the victim, and the lower ones his heart and vitals. The sight was too much for poor Amelia, and this time she fainted dead off, and I had to carry her down the stairs and place her on a bench outside till she recovered. That she felt it to the quick was afterwards shown by the fact that my eldest son bears to this day a rude birthmark on his breast, which has, by family consent, been accepted as representing the Nuremberg Virgin. When we got back to the chamber, we found Hutchison still opposite the Iron Virgin. He'd been evidently philosophising, and now gave us the benefits of this thought in the shape of a sort of exordium. Well, I guess I've been learning something here while Madam has been getting over her faint. Appears to me that we're a long way behind the times on our side of the big drink. We used to think out on the plains that the engine could give us points in trying to make a man uncomfortable, but I guess your old medieval Lord and Order party could raise him every time. Well, Splinters was pretty good in his bluff on the squall, but this here young miss held a straight flush all high on him. The points of them spikes are sharp enough still, though even the edges are eaten out by what used to be on them. It'd be a good thing for our Indian section to get some specimens of this here plate I'll have to send around the reservations just to knock the stuffing out of the bucks, and the squaws too, by showing them as how old civilization lays over them at their best. Guess what I'll get in that box a minute, just to see how it feels. Oh, no, no, said Amelia, it's too terrible. Guess, ma'am, nothing's too terrible to the exploring mind. I've been in some queer places in my time. Spent a night inside a dead horse while a prairie fire swept over me in Montana Territory. Another time slept inside a dead buffalo when a Comanche was on the warpath, and I didn't care to leave my chart on them. 
I've been two days in a caved-in tunnel in the Billy Bronco gold mine of New Mexico, and was one of the four shut up for three parts of a day in a caisson which slid over on a side when we were setting the foundations of the Buffalo Bridge. I've not funked an odd experience yet, and I don't propose to begin now. We saw that he was sat on the experiment, so I said, Well, hurry up, old man, and get through it quick. All right, General, said he, but I calculate we ain't quite ready yet. The gentleman my predecessors watched stood in that there canister didn't volunteer for the office. Not much, I guess. There was some ornamental tying up before the big stroke was made. I want to go into this thing fair and square, so I must get fixed up proper first. I dare say this old galoot can rise some string and tie me up according to sample. This was said interrogatively to the old custodian, but the latter, who understood the drift of his speech, though perhaps not appreciating to the full the niceties of dialect and imagery, shook his head. His protest was, however, only formal and made to be overcome. The American thrust a gold piece into his hand, saying, "'Take it, part it's your pot. Don't be scared. This ain't no necktie party that you're asked to assist in.' He produced some thin frayed rope and proceeded to bind our companion with sufficient strictness for the purpose. When the upper part of his body was bound, Hutchison said, "'Hold on a moment, Judge. Guess I'm too heavy for you to tote into the canister. You just let me walk in, and you can wash up regard to my legs.' Whilst speaking, he had backed himself into the opening, which was just enough to hold him. It was a close fit, and no mistake. Amelia looked on with fear in her eyes, but she evidently did not like to say anything. Then the custodian completed his task by tying the American's feet together, so that he was now absolutely helpless and fixed in his voluntary prison. He seemed to really enjoy it, and the incipient smile which was habitual to his face blossomed into actuality as he said, "'Guess this here Eve was made out of the rib of a dwarf. "'There ain't much room for a full-grown citizen in the United States to hustle. "'We used to make our coffins more roomier in Idaho territory. "'Now, Judge, you just begin to let this door down slow onto me. "'I want to feel the same pleasure as the other jays had "'when those spikes began to move towards their eyes.' "'Oh, no, no,' broke in Amelia hysterically. It, "'It's too terrible. I can't bear to see it. I can't, I can't.' "'But the American was obdurate.' "'Say, Colonel,' said he, "'why not take Madame for a little promenade? "'I wouldn't hurt her feelings for the world, "'but now that I am here, having come eight thousand miles, "'wouldn't it be too hard to give up the very experience "'I've been pining and panting for? "'A man can't get to feel like canned goods every time. "'Me and the judge here will fix up this thing in no time, "'then you'll come back and we'll all laugh together.' "'Once more the resolution that is born of curiosity triumphed, "'and Amelia stayed, holding tight to my arm and shivering, whilst the custodian began to slacken slowly, inch by inch, the rope that held back the iron door. Hutchison's face was positively radiant as his eyes followed the first movement of the spikes. "'Well,' he said, "'I guess I've not had enjoyment like this since I left New York. A bar a scrap of the French seat or a whopping, and that weren't much of a picnic neither. I've not had a show for real pleasure in this dot rotted continent, where there ain't no bars nor no engines, and we're near a mango's heel. Hey, slow there, Judge, don't you rush this business. I want a show for my money this game, I do. The custodian must have had in him some of the blood of his predecessors in that ghastly tower, for he worked the engine with a deliberate and excruciating slowness, which, after five minutes, in which the outer edge of the door had not moved half as many inches, began to overcome Amelia. I saw her lips whiten and felt her hold upon my arm relax. I looked around an instant for a place whereon to lay her, and when I looked at her again, found that her eye had become fixed on the side of the virgin. Following its direction, I saw the black cat crouching out of sight. Her green eyes shone like danger lamps in the gloom of the place, and their colour was heightened by the blood which still smeared her coat and reddened her mouth. I cried out, "'The cat! Look out for the cat!' for even then she sprang out before the engine. At this moment she looked like a triumphant demon. Her eyes blazed with ferocity, her hair bristled out till she seemed twice her normal size, and her tail lashed about as does a tiger's when the quarry is before it. 
Elias P. Hutchison, when he saw her, was amused, and his eyes positively sparkled with fun, as he said. Darned if the score ain't got on all her war paint. Just give her a shove off if she comes any of her tricks on me, for I'm so fixed everlastingly by the boss that darn my skin if I can keep my eyes from her if she wants them. Easy there, judge. Don't you slack that there rope or I'm yuckered. At this moment, Amelia completed her feint, and I had to clutch hold of her round the waist, or she would have fallen to the floor. Whilst attending to her, I saw the black cat crouching for a spring, and jumped up to turn the creature out. But at that instant, with a sort of hellish scream, she hurled herself, not as we expected, at Hutchison, but straight at the face of the custodian. Her claws seemed to be tearing wildly, as one sees in the Chinese drawings of the dragon rampant, and as I looked I saw one of them light on the poor man's eye, and actually tear through it and down his cheek, leaving a wide band of red, where the blood seemed to spurt from every vein. With a yell of sheer terror which came quicker than even his sense of pain, the man leapt back, dropping as he did so the rope which held back the iron door. I jumped for it, but it was too late for the cord ran like lightning through the pulley block, and the heavy mass fell forward from its own weight. As the door closed, I caught a glimpse of our poor companion's face. He seemed frozen with terror. His eyes stared with a horrible anguish, as if dazed, and no sound came from his lips. And then the spikes did their work. Happily the end was quick, for when I wrenched open the door they had pierced so deep that they had locked in the bones of the skull through which they had crushed, and actually tore him, it, out of his iron prison, till, bound as he was, he fell at full length with a sickly thud upon the floor, the face turning upward as he fell. I rushed to my wife, lifted her up and carried her out, for I feared for her very reason if she should wake from her faint to such a scene. I laid her on the bench outside and ran back. Leaning against the wooden column was the custodian, moaning in pain, whilst he held his reddening handkerchief to his eyes. And sitting on the head of the poor American was the cat, purring loudly as she licked the blood which trickled through the gashed socket of his eyes. I think no one will call me cruel, because I seized one of the old executioner's swords and shore her in two as she sat. That's the end of side two. Martin's Close by M. R. James Some few years back I was staying with the rector of a parish in the West, where the society to which I belong owns property. I was to go over some of this land, and on the first morning of my visit, soon after breakfast, the estate carpenter and general handyman John Hill was announced as in readiness to accompany us. The rector asked which part of the parish we were to visit that morning. The estate map was produced, and when we had showed him our round, he put his finger on a particular spot. Don't forget, he said, to ask John Hill about Martin's Close when you get there. I should like to hear what he tells you. Well, what ought he to tell us? I said. I haven't the slightest idea, said the rector. Or, if that is not exactly true, it'll do until lunchtime. And here he was called away. We set out. John Hill is not a man to withhold such information as he possesses on any point, and you may gather from him much that is of interest about the people of the place and their talk. An unfamiliar word, or one that he thinks ought to be unfamiliar to you, he will usually spell as C-O-B, Cobb, and the like. It is not, however, relevant to my purpose to record his conversation before the moment when we reached Martin's Close. The pit of land is noticeable, for it is one of the smallest enclosures you're likely to see. A very few square yards, hedged in with quickset on all sides, and without any gate or gap leading into it. You might take it for a small cottage garden, long deserted, but that it lies away from the village and bears no trace of cultivation. It is at no great distance from the road, and is part of what is there called a moor, in other words, a, a rough upland pasture cut up into largish fields. "'Why is this little bit hedged off so?' I asked, and John Hill, whose answer I cannot represent as perfectly as I should like, was not at fault. 
That's what we call Martin's Closer. There's a curious thing about that bit of land, sir. Goes by the name of Martin's Closer. M-A-R-T-I-N, Martin. Beg pardon, sir. Did Rector tell you to make inquiry of me about that, sir? Uh, yes, he did. I thought so much, sir. I was telling Rector about that last week, and he was very much interested. Pears there's a murderer buried there, sir, by the name of Martin. Now, old Mr. Samuel Saunders, that formerly lived here at what we call South Town, sir, he had a long tale about that, sir. Terrible murder done upon a young woman, sir. Cut her throat and cast her in the water down yar. Was he hung for it? Yes, sir, he was hung just up yar on the roadway, by what I've heard on the Holy Innocence Day, many hundred years ago, by the man that went by the name of the Bloody Judge. Terrible red and bloody, I've heard. What's his name? Jeffreys, do you think? Oh, might be possible, twas, Jeffers, J F uh, Jeffers, I reckon twas, and the tale I've heard many times from Mr. Saunders, uh, this young man Martin, uh, George Martin, was troubled before his cool action come to light by the young woman's spirit. Uh, how's that, do you know? Well, no, sir, I don't exactly know how twas with it, but by what I've heard, he was fairly tormented, and rightly too. Old Mr. Saunders, he told a history regarding a cupboard down here in the new inn. According to what he related, this young woman's spirit came out of this cupboard, but I don't recollect the matter. This was the sum of John Hill's information. We passed on, and in due time I reported what I had heard to the rector. He was able to show me from the parish account books that a gibbet had been paid for in 1684, and a grave dug in the following year both for the benefit of George Martin. But he was unable to suggest anyone in the parish, Saunders being now gone, who was likely to throw any further light on the story. Naturally, upon my return to the neighbourhood of libraries, I made search in the more obvious places. The trial seemed to be nowhere reported. A newspaper of the time, and one or more newsletters, however, had some short notices from which I learned that, on the ground of local prejudice against the prisoner, he was described as a young gentleman of good estate. The venue had been moved from Exeter to London, that Jeffreys had been the judge, and death the sentence, and that there had been some singular passages in the evidence. Nothing further transpired till September of this year, a friend, who knew me to be interested in Jeffreys, then sent me a leaf, torn out of a second-hand bookseller's catalogue, with the entry, Jeffreys, Judge, Interesting Old M.S., Trial for Murder, and so forth, from which I gathered, to my delight, that I could become possessed, for a very few shillings, of what seemed to be a verbatim report, in shorthand, of the Martin trial. I telegraphed for the manuscript, and got it. It was a thin, bound volume, provided with a title written in longhand by someone in the 18th century, who had also added this note. My father, who took these notes in court, told me that the prisoner's friends had made interest with Judge Jeffreys that no report should be put out. He had intended doing this himself when times were better, and had showed it to the Reverend Mr. Glanville, who encouraged his design very warmly, but death surprised them both before it could be brought to an accomplishment. The initials W.G. are appended. I am advised that the original reporter may have been T. Gurney, who appears in that capacity in more than one state trial. This was all that I could read for myself. After no long delay, I heard of someone who was capable of deciphering the shorthand of the 17th century, and a little time ago the typewritten copy of the whole manuscript was laid before me. The portions which I shall communicate here help to fill in the very imperfect outline which subsists in the memories of John Hill, and, I suppose, one or two others who live on the scene of the events. The report begins with a, a species of preface, the general effect of which is that the copy is not that actually taken in court, though it is a true copy in regard of the notes of what was said, but that the writer has added to it some remarkable passages that took place during the trial, and has made this present fair copy of the whole, intending at some favourable time to publish it, but has not put it into longhand, lest it should fall into the possession of unauthorised persons, and he or his family deprived of the profit. The report then begins. 
This case came on to be tried on Wednesday the 19th of November between our Sovereign Lord the King and George Martin Esquire of... I, I take leave to omit some of the place names... at a sessions of Oye and Termina and jail delivery at the Old Bailey and the prisoner being a Newgate was brought to the bar. Clerk of the Crown. George Martin, hold up thy hand, which he did. Then the indictment was read, which set forth that the prisoner, not having the fear of God before his eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil upon the 15th day of May, in the 36th year of our sovereign Lord King Charles II, with force and arms in the parish aforesaid, in and upon Anne Clark, spinster of the same place, in the peace of God and of our said sovereign Lord the King, then and there being feloniously, willfully, and of your malice aforethought, did make an assault, and with a certain knife value a penny the throat of the said Anne Clark then and there did cut of the which wound the said Anne Clark then and there did die and the body of the said Anne Clark did cast into a certain pond of water situate in the same parish with more that is not material to our purpose against the peace of our sovereign lord the king his crown and dignity then the prisoner prayed a copy of the indictment lord chief justice sir george jeffreys what is this? Well, sure, you know, that's never allowed. Beside, here's a plain indictment as ever I heard. You've nothing to do but to plead to it. Prisoner. My lord, I apprehend there may be matter of law arising out of the indictment, and I would humbly beg the court to assign me counsel to consider of it. Besides, my lord, I believe it was done in another case. A copy of the indictment was allowed. Well, what case was that? Oh, truly, my lord, I've been kept close prisoner ever since I came up from Exeter Castle, and no one allowed to come at me and no one to advise with. But I say, what was that case you allege? My lord, I cannot tell your lordship precisely the name of the case, but it is in my mind that there was such an one, and I would humbly desire... Oh, this is nothing. Name your case, and we will tell you whether there be any matter for you in it. God forbid, but you should have anything that may be allowed you by law. But this is against law, and we must uh, keep the course of the court. The Attorney General, Sir Robert Sawyer. My lord, we pray for the king that he may be asked to plead. The Clerk of the Court. Are you guilty of the murder whereof you stand indicted, or not guilty? My lord, I would humbly offer this to the court. If I plead now, shall I have an opportunity after to accept against the indictment? Oh, yes, yes, that comes after verdict. That will be saved to you, and counsel assigned if there be matter of law, but that which you have now to do is to plead. Then, after some little parleying with the court, which seemed strange upon such a plain indictment, the prisoner pleaded, Not guilty. Culprit, how wilt thou be tried? By God and my country. God send thee a good deliverance. Oh, why, how, how is this? There's been a great to-do that you should not be tried at Exeter by your country, but be brought here to London, and now you ask to be tried by your country. Must we send you to Exeter again? My lord, I understood it was the form. Well, sir, it is, man. Oh, we spoke only on the way of pleasantness. Well, go on and swear the jury. So they were sworn. I omit the names. There was no challenging on the prisoner's part, for, as he said, he did not know any of the persons called. Thereupon the prisoner asked for the use of pen, ink and paper, to which the Lord Chief Justice replied, aye, aye, in God's name, let him have it. Then the usual charge was delivered to the jury, and the case opened by the junior counsel for the King, Mr. Dolben. The Attorney General followed. May it please your lordship and you, gentlemen of the jury, I am of counsel for the king against the prisoner at the bar. You have heard that he stands indicted for a murder done upon the person of a young girl. Such crimes as this you may perhaps reckon not to be uncommon, and indeed in these times I am sorry to say it, there is scarce any fact so barbarous and unnatural but what we may hear almost daily instances of it. But I must confess that in this murder that is charged upon the prisoner there are some particular features that mark it out to be such as I hope has but seldom, if ever, been perpetrated upon English ground. For, as we shall make it appear, the person murdered was a poor country girl, whereas the prisoner is a gentleman of a proper estate. 
and besides that was one to whom Providence had not given the full use of her intellects, but was what is termed among us commonly an innocent or natural. Such an one, therefore, as one would have supposed a gentleman of the prisoner's quality more likely to overlook, or, if he did notice her, to be moved to compassion for her unhappy condition than to lift up his hand against her in the very horrid and barbarous manner which we shall show you he used. Now, to begin at the beginning and open the matter to you orderly, about Christmas of last year, that is the year 1683, this gentleman, Mr. Martin, having newly come back into his own country from the University of Cambridge, some of his neighbours, to show him what civility they could, for his family is one that stands in very good repute all over that country, entertained him here and there at their Christmas merry-makings, so that he was constantly riding to and fro, from one house to another, and sometimes, when the place of his destination was distant, or for other reasons as the unsafeness of the roads, he would be constrained to lie the night at an inn. In this way it happened that he came a day or two after the Christmas to the place where this young girl lived with her parents, and put up at the inn there called the New Inn, which is, as I am informed, a house of good repute. Here was some dancing going on among the people of the place, and Anne Clark had been brought in, it seems, by her elder sister to look on. But being, as I have said, of weak understanding, and besides that very uncomely in her appearance, it was not likely that she should take much part in the merriment, and accordingly was but standing by in a corner of the room. The prisoner at the bar, seeing her, one must suppose by way of a jest, asked her would she dance with him, and in spite of what her sister and others could say to prevent it and to dissuade her, Oh, come, Mr. Attorney, we are not set here to listen to tales of Christmas parties in taverns. I would not interrupt you, but sure you have more weighty matters than this. You'll be telling us next what tune they danced to. My lord, I would not take up the time of the court with what is not material, but we reckon it to be material to show how this unlikely acquaintance begun. As for the tune, I believe, indeed, our evidence will show that even that hath a bearing on the matter in hand. Oh, go on, go on, in God's name, but give us nothing that is impertinent. Indeed, my lord, I will keep to my matter." But, gentlemen, having now shown you, as I think, enough of this first meeting between the murdered person and the prisoner, I will shorten my tale so far as to say that from then on there were frequent meetings of the two, for the young woman was greatly tickled with having got hold, as she conceived it, of so lightly a sweetheart, and he being once a week at least in the habit of passing through the street where she lived, she would be always on the watch for him, and it seems they had a, a signal arranged. He should whistle the tune that was played at the tavern. It is a tune, as I am formed, well known in that country, and has a burden, Madam, will you walk? Uh, will you talk with me? I remember it in my own country, in Shropshire. It runs somehow, that's the one. But it was as a burden. Here his lordship whistled a part of a tune which was very observable, and seemed below the dignity of the court, and it appears he felt so himself, for he said, Oh, but <laughs> this is by the mark, and I doubt it is the first time we've had dance tunes in this court. Uh, the most part of the dancing we give occasion for is done at Tyburn. Looking at the prisoner, who appeared very much disordered, Why, you said the tune was material to your case, Mr. Attorney, upon my life. I think Mr. Martin agrees with you. What ails a man? Staring like a player that sees a ghost. My lord, I was amazed at hearing such trivial, foolish things as they bring against me. Well, well, it lies upon Mr. Attorney to show whether they be trivial or not. But I must say, if it's nothing worse than this, he has said, you've no great cause to be in a maze. Does it not lie something deeper? But uh, go on, Mr. Attorney. My lord and gentlemen, all that I have said so far you may indeed very reasonably reckon as having an appearance of triviality. And to be sure, had the matter gone no further than the humouring of a poor silly girl by a young gentleman of quality, it had been very well. 
but to proceed, we shall make it appear that after three or four weeks the prisoner became contracted to a young gentlewoman of that country, one suitable every way to his own condition, and such an arrangement was on foot that seemed to promise him a happy and a reputable living. But within no very long time, it seems, that this young gentlewoman, hearing of the jest that was going about that countryside with regard to the prisoner and Anne Clark, conceived that it was not only an unworthy carriage on the part of her lover, but a derogation to herself that he should suffer his name to be sport for tavern company. And so, without more ado, she, with the consent of her parents, signified to the prisoner that the match between them was at an end. We shall show you that upon the receipt of this intelligence, the prisoner was greatly enraged against Anne Clark as being the cause of his misfortune, though indeed there was nobody answerable for it but himself, and that he made use of many outrageous expressions and threatenings against her, and subsequently upon meeting with her, both abused her and struck at her with his whip. But she, being but a poor innocent, could not be persuaded to desist from her attachment to him, but would often run after him, testifying with gestures and broken words the affection she had to him, until she was become, as he said, the very plague of his life. Yet, being that affairs in which he was now engaged necessarily took him by the house in which she lived, he could not, as I am willing to believe he would otherwise have done, Avoid meeting with her from time to time. We shall further show you that this was the posture of things up to the 15th day of May in this present year. Upon that day, the prisoner comes riding through the village as of custom and met with the young woman. But in place of passing her by, as he had lately done, he stopped and said some words to her with which she appeared wonderfully pleased, and so left her. And after that day she was nowhere to be found, notwithstanding a strict search was made for her. The next time of the prisoners passing through the place, her relations inquired of him whether he should know anything of her whereabouts, which he totally denied. They expressed to him their fears, lest her weak intellects should have been upset by the attention he had shown her, and so she might have committed some rash act against her own life, calling him to witness the same time how often they had beseeched him to desist from taking notice of her, as fearing trouble might come of it. But this, too, he easily laughed away. But in spite of this light behaviour, it was noticeable in him that about this time his carriage and demeanour changed, and it was said of him that he seemed a troubled man. And here I come to a passage to which I should not dare to ask your attention, but that it appears to me to be founded in truth, and is supported by testimony deserving of credit, and, uh, gentlemen, to my judgment it doth afford a great instance of God's revenge against murder, and that he will require the blood of the innocent. Here Mr. Attorney made a pause and shifted with his papers, and it was thought remarkable by me and others, because he was a man not easily dashed. Well, Mr. Attorney, what is your instance? My lord, it is a strange one, and the truth is that of all the cases I have been concerned in, I cannot call to mind the like of it. But to be short, gentlemen, we shall bring you testimony that Anne Clark was seen after this 15th of May, and that at such time as she was so seen, it was impossible she could have been a living person. Here the people made a hum and a good deal of laughter, and the court called for silence, and when it was made, Oh, why, Mr. Attorney? You might save up this tale for a week. It'll be Christmas by that time, and you can frighten your cookmaids with it. At which the people laughed again, and the prisoner also, as it seemed. Oh, God, man, what are you prating of? Ghosts and Christmas jigs and tavern company, and here is a man's life at stake? And you, sir, I'd have you know, there's not so much occasion for you to make merry neither. 
You were not brought here for that. And if I know Mr. Attorney, he's more in his brief than he has shown yet. Go on, Mr. Attorney. I need not may have spoken so sharply, but you must confess your course is something unusual. Nobody knows it better than I, my lord. But I shall bring it to an end with a round turn. I shall show you, gentlemen, that Anne Clark's body was found in the month of June in a pond of water with a throat cut, that a knife belonging to the prisoner was found in the same water, that he made efforts to recover the said knife from the water, that the coroner's quest brought in a verdict against the prisoner at the bar, and that therefore he should by course have been tried at Exeter, but that suit being made on his behalf, on account that an impartial jury could not be found to try him in his own country, he hath had that singular favour shown him that he should be tried here in London, and so we will proceed to call our evidence. Then the facts of the acquaintance between the prisoner and Anne Clark were proved, and also the coroner's inquest. I pass over this portion of the trial, for it offers nothing of special interest. Sarah Ascot was next called and sworn. What is your occupation? I keep the new inn. Do you know the prisoner at the bar? Oh, yes, he was oftener at our house since he come first at Christmas of last year. Did you know Anne Clark? Yes, very well. Pray, what manner of person was she in her appearance? Well, she's a very short, thick maid woman. I do not know what else you'd have me say. Was she comely? Oh, no, not by no manner of means. She was very uncomely, poor child. She had a great face and hanging sharp, very bad colour, like a puddock. What's that, mistress? What say you she was like? My lord, I ask pardon. I heard us why Martin say she looked like a puddock in the face, and so she did. Did you that? Can you interpret her, Mr. Turney? My lord, I apprehend it is the country word for a toad. Oh, you don't know, a hopper toad. Go on. Will you give an account to the jury of what passed between you and the prisoner at the bar in May last? Well, sir, it was this. It was about nine o'clock in the evening after that Anne did not come home, and I was about my work in the house, and there was no company there, only Thomas Snell, and it was foul weather. Esquire and Martin came in and called for some drink, and I, by way of pleasantry, I said to him, Oh, Squire, have you been looking after your sweetheart? And he flew out at me in a passion and desired I would not use such expressions. I was amazed at that, because we were accustomed to joke with him about her. Who? Oh, her. Uh. "'And Clark, my lord, and, and we'd not heard the news of his being contracted to a young gentlewoman elsewhere, or I'm sure I should have used better manners. So I said nothing, but being I was a little put out, I began singing to myself, as it were, the song they danced to the first time they met, for I, I thought it would prick him. It was the same that he was used to sing when he come down the street. I've heard it very often. Madam, will you walk? Will you talk with me?' And it fell out that I needed something that was in the kitchen, so I, I went out to get it, and all the time I went on singing, or well, something louder and more bold-like, and as I was there, all of a sudden, I thought I heard someone answering outside the house, but I could not be sure because of the wind blowing so high. So when I stopped singing, and now I heard it plain, saying, "'Yes, sir, I will walk.' I will talk with you, and I knew the voice for Anne Clark's voice. How did you know it to be her voice? But it was impossible I could be mistaken. She had a dreadful voice, a kind of squalling voice, in particular, if she tried to sing. And there was nobody in the village that could counterfeit it, for they'd often tried. So hearing that, I was glad, because we were all in an anxiety to know what was gone with her. For though she was a natural, she had a good disposition, was very tractable. And says I to myself, What, child, are you returned then? And I ran from the front room and said to Squire Matt, as I passed by, Squire, here's your sweetheart back again. Shall I call her in? And with that, I went to open the door. But Squire Martin, he caught hold of me, and it seemed to me he was out of his wits near upon. Hold, woman, says he, in God's name, and I know not what else. He was all of a shake. Then I was angry and said I, what? Are you not glad the poor child is found? And I called to Thomas Snell and said, if the squire will not let me, do you open the door and call her in? So Thomas Snell went and opened the door, and the wind setting that way blew in and overset the two candles that was all we had lighted. 
and as Squire Martin fell away from holding me, I think he fell down on the floor, but we were only in the dark, and it was a minute or two before I got the light again, and while I was feeling for the firebox, I am not certain, but I heard someone step across the floor, and I'm sure I heard the door of the great cupboard that stands in the room open and shut too, and then when I had a light again, I see a Squire Martin unsettle all white and sweaty as if he'd swooned away and his arms hanging down. I know I was going to help him, but just then it caught my eye that there was something like a bit of a dress shut in the cupboard door, and it came to my mind I'd heard that door shut. So I thought it might be some person had run in when the light was quenched and was hiding in the cupboard, so I went up closer and looked, and there was a bit of black stuffed cloak, and just below it an edge of a brown stuffed dress, both sticking out of the shut of the door, and both of them was low down, as if the person that had them on might be crouched down inside. What did you take it to be? What I took it to be a woman's dress. Could you make any guess whom it belonged to? Did you know anyone who wore such a dress? Well, it was common stuff, by what I could see. I've seen many women wearing such a stuff in our parish. Was it like Anne Clark's dress? She used to wear such a dress, but I, I, I could not say on my oath it was hers. Did you observe anything else about it? I did notice that it, it looked very wet, but, but it was foul weather outside. Did you, uh, did you, did you feel of it, uh, mistress? Oh, no, my lord. I did not like to touch it. Not like? Oh, why, that are you so nice that you scrupled to feel of a wet dress? Indeed, my lord, I cannot very well tell why, only it had a nasty, ugly look about it. Well, go on. Well, then I called again to Thomas Snell and bid him come to me and catch anyone that came out when I should open the cupboard door for, says I, there is someone hiding within and I would know what she wants. And with that, Squire Martin gave a sort of a cry or a shout and ran out of the house into the dark, and I felt the cupboard door pushed out against me while I held it, and Thomas Snell helped me. But for all we pressed to keep it shut as hard as we could, it was forced out against us, and we had to fall back. And pray, what came out? A mouse? No, my lord, it was greater than a mouse, but I could not see what it was. It, it fleeted very swift over the floor and out of the door. Oh, but come, what did it look like? Was it uh, a person? Oh, my lord, I cannot tell what it was, but it, it ran very low and it, it was of a dark colour. We were both daunted by it, Thomas Nell and I, but we made all the haste we could after it to the door that stood open and we looked out, but it was dark and we could see nothing. Was there no... Tracks of it on the floor? Mm. What uh, what floor have you there? Oh, it's a flag floor and sand in my lord, and, and there was an appearance of a wet track on the floor, but we could make nothing of it, neither Thomas Nell nor me, and besides, as I said, it, it was a foul night. Well, for my part, I see not, no, to be sure it is an odd tale she tells. What you would do with this evidence, uh, Mr. Attorney? My lord, we bring it to show the suspicious carriage of the prisoner immediately after the disappearance of the murdered person, and we ask the jury's consideration of that, and also to the matter of the voice heard without the house. Then the prisoner asked some questions, not very material, and Thomas Snell was next called, who gave evidence to the same effect as Mrs. Arscott, and then the following... Did anything pass between you and the prisoner during the time Mrs. Oscott was out of the room? Uh, Well, I I had a piece of twist in my pocket. A twist of what? A twist of tobacco, sir, and I felt a disposition to take a pipe of tobacco. So I I found a pipe on the chimney piece, and being it was twist, and in regard of me having by an oversight left my knife at my house, and being not having over many teeth to pluck at it, as your lordship or anyone else may have a view by your own eyesight. What is the man talking about? Come to the matter, fellow. Do you think we sit here to look at your teeth? Oh, no, my lord, nor I would not you should do, God forbid. I know your honours have better employment and, and, and better teeth, I would not wonder. Good God, what a man is this. Yes, I have better teeth, and that you shall find if you keep not to the purpose. 
I, I, I humbly asked pardon, my lord, but so it was, and, and I took upon me, thinking no harm, to ask Squire Martin to lend me his knife to cut my tobacco. And he felt first of one pocket and then of another, and was not there at all. And says I, oh, what, have you lost your knife, Squire? And up he gets and feels again, and he sat down, and such a groan as he gave. The good God, he says, I must have left it there. Oh, but, says I, Squire, by all appearance, it is not there. Huh, did you set the value on it, says I? You might have it cried. But he sat there and put his head between his hands and seemed to take no notice to what I said. And then it was Mistress Ascot come tracking back out of the kitchen place. Asked if he heard the voice singing outside the house, he said, No, but the door into the kitchen was shut and there was a high wind, but says that no one could mistake Anne Clark's voice. Then a boy, William Redaway, about thirteen years of age, was called, and by the usual questions put by the Lord Chief Justice, it was ascertained that he knew the nature of an oath, and so he was sworn. His evidence referred to a time about a week later. "'Now, child, don't be frighted. "'There is no one here will hurt you if you speak the truth.' "'Aye, if you speak the truth. "'But remember, child, thou art in the presence of the great God in heaven and earth. "'It hath the keys of hell, and of us that are the king's officers, "'and have the keys of Nougat. "'And remember, too, there is a man's life in question. "'And if thou tellest a lie, and by that means he comes to an ill end, "'thou art no better than his murderer. "'And so—' Speak the truth. Tell the jury what you know and speak out. Where were you on the evening of the 23rd of May last? Oh, why, what does what what such a boy as this know of days? Can you mark the day, boy? Yes, my lord. It was the day before our feast, and I was to spend sixpence there, and that falls a, a month before Midsummer Day. My lord, we cannot hear what he says. He says he remembers the day because it was the day before the, the feast they had there and he had sixpence to lay out. Sit him up on the table there. Well, child, and where wast thou then? Keep him close on the moor, my lord. But the boy, using the country speech, my lord could not well apprehend him and so asked if there was any one that could interpret him and it was answered... The parson of the parish was there, and he was accordingly sworn, and so the evidence given. The boy said, I was on the moor about six o'clock, and sitting behind a bush of firs near a pond of water, and the prisoner came very cautiously, and looking about him, having something like a long pole in his hand, and stopped a good while, as if he would be listening, and then began to feel in the water with the pole, and I being very near the water, not about five yards, heard as if the pole struck up against something that made a wallowing sound, and the prisoner dropped the pole and threw himself on the ground and rolled himself about very strangely with his hands to his ears, and so after a while got up and went creeping away. Asked if he had had any communication with the prisoner, Oh, yes, a day or two before the prisoner, hearing I was used to be on the moor, he asked me if I'd seen a knife laying about and said he would give sixpence to find it. And I said I'd not seen any such thing, but I would ask about. And then he said he would give me sixpence to say nothing, and so he did. And was that the sixpence you were to lay out at the feast? <laughs> yes, if you please, my lord. Asked if he had observed anything particular as to the pond of water, he said, No, except that it begun to have a very ill smell and the cows would not drink of it for some days before. Asked if he had ever seen the prisoner and Anne Clark in company together, he began to cry very much, and it was a long time before they could get him to speak intelligibly. At last the parson of the parish, Mr Matthews, got him to be quiet, and the question being put to him again, he said he'd seen Anne Clark waiting on the moor for the prisoner at some way off several times since last Christmas. Did you see her close? So as to be sure it was she? Yes, quite sure. Well, how quite sure, child? Because she would stand and, and jump up and down and clap her arms like a goose, which he called by some country name, but the parson explained it to be a goose. And, and then she was of such a shape that it could not be no one else. What was the last time that you so saw her? Then the witness began to cry again and clung very much to Mr. Matthews, who bid him not to be frightened. And so at last he told this story. 
that on the day before their feast, being the same evening that he had before spoken of, after the prisoner had gone away, it being then twilight, and he very desirous to get home, but afraid for the present to stir from where he was, lest the prisoner should see him, remained some few minutes behind the bush, looking on the pond, and saw something dark come up out of the water at the edge of the pond furthest away from him, and so up the bank. And when it got to the top where he could see it plain against the sky, it stood up and flapped the arms up and down, and then run off very swiftly in the same direction the prisoner had taken. And being asked very strictly who he took it to be, he said upon his oath that it could be nobody but Anne Clark. Thereafter his master was called and gave evidence that the boy had come home very late that evening and been chided for it, and that he seemed very much amazed, but could give no account of the reason. "'My lord, we have done with our evidence for the king.' Then the Lord Chief Justice called upon the prisoner to make his defence, which he did, though at no great length, and in a very halting way, saying that he hoped the jury would not go about to take his life on the evidence of a parcel of country people and children that would believe any idle tale, and that he had been very much prejudiced in his trial, at which the Lord Chief Justice interrupted him, saying that he had had singular favour shown to him in having his trial removed from Exeter, which the prisoner acknowledging said that he meant rather that since he was brought to London there had not been care taken to keep him secured from interruption and disturbance upon which the Lord Chief Justice ordered the Marshal to be called, and questioned him about the safekeeping of the prisoner, but could find nothing, except the Marshal said that he'd been informed by the underkeeper that they had seen a person outside his door or going up the stairs to it, but there was no possibility the person should have got in, and it being inquired further what sort of person this might be, the marshal could not speak to it save by hearsay, which was not allowed, and the prisoner, being asked if this was what he meant, said, so he knew nothing of that, but it was very hard that a man should not be suffered to be at quiet when his life stood on it. But it was observed he was very hasty in his denial, and so he said no more, and called no witnesses, whereupon the attorney-general spoke to the jury, a full report of what he said is given, and if time allowed, I would extract that portion in which he dwells on the alleged appearance of the murdered person. He quotes some authorities of ancient date, as St. Augustine, De Cura Pro Mortuis Gerenda, a favourite book of reference with the old writers on the supernatural, and also cites some cases which may be seen in Glanville's, but more conveniently in Mr. Lang's books. He does not, however, tell us more of those cases than is to be found in print. The Lord Chief Justice then summed up the evidence for the jury. His speech again contains nothing that I find worth copying out, but he was naturally impressed with the singular character of the evidence, saying that he'd never heard such given in his experience, but that there was nothing in law to set it aside, and that the jury must consider whether they believed these witnesses or not and the jury, after a very short consultation, brought the prisoner in guilty. So he was asked whether he had anything to say in arrest of judgment, and pleaded that his name was spelt wrong in the indictment, being Martin with an I, whereas it should be with a Y, but this was overruled as not material, Mr. Attorney saying, moreover, that he could bring evidence to show that the prisoner by times wrote it as it was laid in the indictment, and the prisoner, having nothing further to offer, Sentence of death was passed upon him, and that he should be hanged in chains upon a gibbet near the place where the fact was committed, and that execution should take place upon the 28th of December next ensuing, being Innocence Day. Thereafter the prisoner, being to all appearance in a state of desperation, made shift to ask the Lord Chief Justice that his relations might be allowed to come to him during the short time he had to live. "'Aye, with all my heart,' so it be in the presence of the keeper, and Anne Clark may come to you as well, for what I care. 
at which the prisoner broke out and cried to his lordship not to use such words to him, and his lordship very angrily told him he deserved no tenderness at any man's hands for a cowardly, butcherly murderer that had not the stomach to take the reward of his deeds. And I hope to God, said he, that she will be with you by day and by night till an end is made of you. Then the prisoner was removed, and, so far as I saw, he was in a swoon, and the court broke up. I cannot refrain from observing that the prisoner, during all the time of the trial, seemed to be more uneasy than is commonly the case even in capital causes, that, for example, he was looking narrowly among the people and often turning round very sharply, as if some person might be at his ear, it was also very noticeable at this trial what a silence the people kept, and further, though this might not be otherwise than natural in that season of the year, what a darkness and obscurity there was in the courtroom, lights being brought in not long after two o'clock in the day, and yet no fog in the town. It was not without interest that I heard lately from some young men who'd been giving a concert in the village I speak of, that a very cold reception was accorded to the song which has been mentioned in this narrative, Madam, Will You Walk? It came out in some talk they had next morning with some of the local people that that song was regarded with an invincible repugnance. It was not so they believed at North Torton, but here it was reckoned to be unlucky. However, why that view was taken, no one had the shadow of an idea. That's the end of side three. Please go to the end of the tape and turn over. The Man in the Bell by W. E. Aiton In my younger days, bell ringing was much more in fashion among the young men of our city than it is now. Well, nobody, I believe, practices it at present except the servants of the church, and the melody has been much injured in consequence. Some fifty years ago, about twenty of us who dwelt in the vicinity of the cathedral formed a club which used to ring every peal that was called for, and from continual practice and a rivalry which arose between us and a club attached to another steeple, and which tended considerably to sharpen our zeal, we became very Mozarts on our favourite instruments. But my bell-ringing practice was shortened by a singular accident which not only stopped my performance, but made even the sound of a bell terrible to my ears. One Sunday I went with another into the belfry to ring for noon prayers, but the second stroke we had pulled showed us that the clapper of the bell we were at was muffled. Someone had been buried that morning, and it had been prepared, of course, to ring a mournful note. We did not know of this, but the remedy was easy. Jack, said my companion, step up to the loft and cut off the hat for the way we had of muffling was by tying a piece of an old hat or of cloth, the former was preferred, to one side of the clapper, which deadened every second toll. I complied, and mounting into the belfry, crept as usual into the bell, where I began to cut away. The hat had been tied on in some more complicated manner than usual, and I was perhaps three or four minutes in getting it off, during which time my companion below was hastily called away by a message from his sweetheart, I believe, but that is not material to my story. The person who called him was a brother of the club, who, knowing that the time had come for ringing for service, and not thinking that any one was above, began to pull. At this moment I was just getting out, when I felt the bell moving. I guessed the reason at once. It was a moment of terror, but by a hasty and almost convulsive effort I succeeded in jumping down and throwing myself on the flat of my back under the bell. The room in which it was was little more than sufficient to contain it, the bottom of the bell coming within a couple of feet of the floor of lath. At that time I certainly was not so bulky as I am now, but as I lay it was within an inch of my face. I had not laid myself down a second when the ringing began. It was a dreadful situation. 
Over me swung an immense mass of metal, one touch of which would have crushed me to pieces. The floor under me was principally composed of crazy laths, and if they gave way, I was precipitated to the distance of about fifty feet upon a loft, which would, in all probability, have sunk under the impulse of my fall, and sent me to be dashed to atoms upon the marble floor of the chancel a hundred feet below. I remembered, for fear is quick in recollection, how a common clockwright about a month before had fallen and, bursting through the floors of the steeple, driven in the ceilings of the porch and even broken into the marble tombstone of a bishop who slept beneath. This was my first terror, but the ringing had not continued a minute before a more awful and immediate dread came on me. The deafening sound of the bells smote into my ears with a thunder which made me fear their drums would crack. There was not a fibre of my body it did not thrill through. It entered my very soul. Thought and reflection were almost utterly banished. I only retained the sensation of agonising terror. Every moment I saw the bell sweep within an inch of my face, and my eyes, I could not close them, though to look at the object was bitter as death, followed it instinctively in its oscillating progress until it came back again. It was in vain, I said to myself, that it could come no nearer at any future swing than it did at first. Every time it descended I endeavoured to shrink into the very floor to avoid being buried under the down-sweeping mass and then, reflecting on the danger of pressing too weightily on my frail support, would cower up again as far as I dared. At first my fears were mere matter of fact. I was afraid the pulleys above would give way and let the bell plunge on me. At another time the possibility of the clapper being shot out in some sweep and dashing through my body as I'd seen a ramrod glide through a door flitted across my mind. The dread also, as I have already mentioned, of the crazy floor tormented me, but these soon gave way to fears not more unfounded, but more visionary, and, of course, more tremendous. The roaring of the bell confused my intellect, and my fancy soon began to teem with all sorts of strange and terrifying ideas— the bell peeling above and opening its jaws with a hideous clamour seemed to me at one time a ravening monster raging to devour me, at another a whirlpool ready to suck me into its bellowing abyss. As I gazed on it, it assumed all shapes. It was a flying eagle, or rather a rock of the Arabian storytellers, clapping its wings and screaming over me. As I looked upwards into it, it would appear sometimes to lengthen into indefinite extent, or to be twisted at the end into the spiral folds of the tail of a flying dragon. Nor was the flaming breath or fiery glance of that fabled animal wanting to complete the picture. My eyes, inflamed, bloodshot and glaring, invested the supposed monster with a full proportion of unholy light. It would be endless were I to merely hint at all the fancies that possessed my mind. Every object that was hideous and roaring presented itself to my imagination. I often thought that I was in a hurricane at sea, and that the vessel in which I was embarked tossed under me with the most furious vehemence. The air, set in motion by the swinging of the bell, blew over me, nearly with a violence and more than the thunder of a tempest, and the floor seemed to reel under me as under a drunken man. But the most awful of all the ideas that seized on me were drawn from the supernatural. In the vast cavern of the bell hideous faces appeared and glared down on me with terrifying frowns, or with grinning mockery, still more appalling. At last, the devil himself, accoutred as in the common description of the evil spirit, with hoof, horn, and tail, and eyes of infernal lustre, made his appearance, and called on me to curse God, and worship him who was powerful to save me. This dread suggestion he uttered with the full-toned clangour of the bell. I had him within an inch of me, and I thought on the fate of the Santon Basisa. 
Strenuously and desperately I defied him and bade him be gone. Reason then for a moment resumed her sway, but it was only to fill me with fresh terror, just as the lightning dispels the gloom that surrounds the benighted mariner, but to show him that his vessel is driving on a rock where she must inevitably be dashed to pieces. I found I was becoming delirious, and trembled lest reason should utterly desert me. This is at all times an agonising thought, but it smote me then with tenfold agony. I feared lest, when utterly deprived of my senses, I should rise to do which I was every moment tempted by that strange feeling which calls on a man whose head is dizzy from standing on the battlement of a lofty castle to precipitate himself from it, and then death would be instant and tremendous. When I thought of this I became desperate. I caught the floor with a grasp which drove the blood from my nails, and I yelled with a cry of despair. I called for help, I prayed, I shouted, but all the efforts of my voice were, of course, drowned in the bell. As it passed over my mouth, it occasionally echoed my cries, which mixed not with its own sound, but preserved their distinct character. Perhaps this was but fancy. To me, I know, they then sounded as if they were the shouting, howling, or laughing of the fiends with which my imagination had peopled the gloomy cave which swung over me. You may accuse me of exaggerating my feelings, but I am not. Many a scene of dread have I since passed through, but they are nothing to the self-inflicted terrors of this half-hour. The ancients have doomed one of the damned in their Tartarus to lie under a rock which every moment seems to be descending to annihilate him, and an awful punishment it would be. But if to this you add a clamour as loud as if ten thousand furies were howling about you, a deafening uproar, banishing reason, and driving you to madness, you must allow that the bitterness of the pang was rendered more terrible. There is no man, firm as his nerves may be, who could retain his courage in this situation. In twenty minutes the ringing was done. Half of that time passed over me without power of computation. The other half appeared an age. When it ceased, I became gradually more quiet. But a new fear retained me. I knew that five minutes would elapse without ringing, but at the end of that short time the bell would be rung a second time for five minutes more. I could not calculate time. A minute and an hour were of equal duration. I feared to rise, lest the five minutes should have elapsed, and the ringing be again commenced, in which case I should be crushed before I could escape against the walls or framework of the bell. I therefore still continued to lie down, cautiously shifting myself, however, with a careful gliding, so that my eye no longer looked into the hollow. This was of itself a considerable relief. The cessation of the noise had, in a great measure, the effect of stupefying me, for my attention, being no longer occupied by the chimeras I had conjured up, began to flag. All that now distressed me was the constant expectation of the second ringing, for which, however, I settled myself with a kind of stupid resolution. I closed my eyes and clenched my teeth as firmly as if they were screwed in a vice. At last the dreaded moment came, and the first swing of the bell extorted a groan from me, as they say the most resolute victim screams at the sight of the rack to which he is for a second time destined. After this, however, I lay silent and lethargic, without a thought. Wrapped in the defensive armour of stupidity, I defied the bell and its intonations. When it ceased, I was roused a little by the hope of escape. I did not, however, decide on this step hastily, but, putting up my hand with the utmost caution, I touched the rim. Though the ringing had ceased, it still was tremulous from the sound, and shook under my hand, which instantly recoiled as from an electric jar. A quarter of an hour, probably, elapsed before I again dared to make the experiment, and then I found it at rest.
I determined to lose no time, fearing that I might have delayed already too long, and that the bell for evening service would catch me. This dread stimulated me, and I slipped out with the utmost rapidity and arose. I stood, I suppose, for a minute, looking with silly wonder on the place of my imprisonment, penetrated with joy of escaping, but then rushed down the stony and irregular stair with the velocity of lightning and arrived in the bell-ringer's room. This was the last act I had power to accomplish. I leaned against the wall, motionless and deprived of thought, in which posture my companions found me when, in the course of a couple of hours, they returned to their occupation. They were shocked, as well they might, at the figure before them. The wind of the bell had excoriated my face, and my dim and stupefied eyes were fixed with a lacklustre gaze in my raw eyelids. My hands were torn and bleeding, my hair dishevelled, and my clothes tattered. They spoke to me, but I gave no answer. They shook me, but I remained insensible. They then became alarmed and hastened to remove me. He who had first gone up with me in the forenoon met them as they carried me through the churchyard, and through him, who was shocked at having in some measure occasioned the accident, the cause of my misfortune was discovered. I was put to bed at home, and remained for three days delirious, but gradually recovered my senses. You may be sure the bell formed a prominent topic of my ravings, and if I heard a peal, they were instantly increased to the utmost violence. Even when the delirium abated, my sleep was continually disturbed by imagined ringings, and my dreams were haunted by the fancies which almost maddened me while in the steeple. My friends removed me to a house in the country, which was sufficiently distant from any place of worship, to save me from the apprehensions of hearing the church-going bell. For what Alexander Selkirk in Cooper's poem complained of as a misfortune was then to me as a blessing. Here I recovered, but even long after recovery, if a gale wafted the notes of appeal towards me, I started with nervous apprehension. I felt a Mahometan hatred to all the Bell tribe, and envied the subjects of the Commander of the Faithful the sonorous voice of their Muetzin. Time cured this, as it does the most of our follies, but even at the present day, if by chance my nerves be unstrung, some particular tones of the Cathedral Bell have power to surprise me, and to a momentary start... Caterpillars by E. F. Benson I saw a month or two ago, in an Italian paper, that the Villa Cascana, in which I once stayed, had been pulled down, and that a manufactory of some sort was in process of erection on its site. There is, therefore, no longer any reason for refraining from writing of those things which I myself saw, or imagined I saw, in a certain room and on a certain landing, of the villa in question, nor from mentioning the circumstances which followed, which may or may not, according to the opinion of the reader, throw some light on or be somehow connected with this experience. The Villa Cascana was in all ways but one a perfectly delightful house, yet if it were standing now, nothing in the world, I use the phrase in its literal sense, would induce me to set foot in it again, for I believe it to have been haunted in a very terrible and practical manner. Now, most ghosts, when all is said and done, do not do much harm. They may perhaps terrify, but the person whom they visit usually gets over their visitation. They may, on the other hand, be entirely friendly and beneficent. But the appearances in the Villa Cascana were not beneficent, and had they made their visit in a very slightly different manner, I do not suppose I should have got over it more than Arthur Ingalls did. The house stood on an ilex-clad hill not far from Sestri di Levante on the Italian Riviera, looking out over the iridescent blues of that enchanted sea, 
while behind it rose the pale green chestnut woods that climb up the hillsides till they give place to the pines that, black in contrast with them, crown the slopes. All round it the garden, in the luxuriance of mid-spring, bloomed and was fragrant, and the scent of magnolia and rose, borne on the salt freshness of the winds from the sea, flowed like a stream through the cool vaulted rooms. On the ground floor, a broad pillared loggia ran round three sides of the house, the top of which formed a balcony for certain rooms on the first floor. The main staircase, broad and of grey marble steps, led up from the hall to the landing outside these rooms, which were three in number, namely two big sitting rooms and a bedroom arranged en suite. The latter was unoccupied, the sitting rooms were in use. From here the main staircase continued up to the second floor, where were situated certain bedrooms, one of which I occupied, while on the other side of the first floor landing some half-dozen steps led to another suite of rooms where, at the time I am speaking of, Arthur Ingalls, the artist, had his bedroom and studio. Thus the landing outside my bedroom, at the top of the house, commanded both the landing of the first floor and also the steps that led to Ingalls' rooms. Jim Stanley and his wife, finally, whose guest I was, occupied rooms in another wing of the house, where also were the servants' quarters. I arrived, just in time for lunch, on a brilliant noon of mid-May. The garden was shouting with colour and fragrance, and not less delightful after my broiling walk up from the marina, should have been the coming from the reverberating heat and blaze of the day into the marble coolness of the villa. Only, the reader has my bare word for this and nothing more, the moment I set foot in the house I felt that something was wrong. This feeling, I may say, was quite vague, though very strong, and I remember that when I saw letters waiting for me on the table in the hall I felt certain that the explanation was here. I was convinced that there was bad news of some sort for me. Yet, when I opened them, I found no such explanation of my premonition. My correspondence all reeked of prosperity. Yet this clear miscarriage of a presentiment did not dissipate my uneasiness. In that cool, fragrant house there was something wrong. I am at pains to mention this, because it may explain why it was that, though I am as a rule so excellent a sleeper that the extinction of a light on getting into bed is apparently contemporaneous with being called on the following morning, I slept very badly on my first night in the Villa Cascana. It may also explain that fact that when I did sleep, if it was indeed in sleep that I saw what I thought I saw, I dreamed in a very vivid and original manner, original, that is to say, in the sense that something which, as far as I knew, had never previously entered into my consciousness, usurped it then. But since, in addition to this evil premonition, certain words and events occurring during the rest of the day might have suggested something of what I thought happened that night, it will be well to relate them. After lunch, then, I went round the house with Mrs. Stanley, and during our tour she referred, it is true, to the unoccupied bedroom on the first floor, which opened out of the room where we had lunched. "'We left that unoccupied,' she said, "'because Jim and I have a charming bedroom and dressing room, as you saw, in the wing, and if we used it ourselves we should have to turn the dining-room into a dressing-room and have our meals downstairs. As it is, however, we have our little flat there. Arthur Ingalls has his little flat in the other passage, and I remembered, aren't I extraordinary, that you once said that the higher up you were in a house, the better you were pleased. So I, I put you at the top of the house in, in, instead of giving you that room. It is true that a doubt, vaguely as my uneasy premonition, crossed my mind at this. I did not see why Mrs. Stanley should have explained all this if there had not been more to explain. I allow, therefore, that the thought that there was something to explain about the unoccupied bedroom was momentarily present to my mind. The second thing that may have borne on my dream was this. At dinner the conversation turned for a moment on ghosts. 
Ingalls, with a certainty of conviction, expressed his belief that anybody who could possibly believe in the existence of supernatural phenomena was unworthy of the name of an ass. Well, the subject instantly dropped. As far as I can recollect, nothing else occurred or was said that could bear on what follows. We all went to bed rather early, and personally I yawned my way upstairs, feeling hideously sleepy. My room was rather hot, and I threw all the windows wide, and from without poured in the white light of the moon and the love-song of many nightingales. I undressed quickly and got into bed, but though I had felt so sleepy before, I now felt extremely wide awake. But I was quite content to be awake. I did not toss or turn. I felt perfectly happy listening to the song and seeing the light. Then it is possible I may have gone to sleep, and what follows may have been a dream. I thought, anyhow, that after a time the nightingale ceased singing, and the moon sank. I thought also that if, for some unexplained reason, I was going to lie awake all night, I might as well read, and I remembered that I had left a book in which I was interested in the dining-room on the first floor, so I got out of bed, lit a candle, and went downstairs. I entered the room, saw on a side-table the book I had come to look for, and then, simultaneously, saw that the door into the unoccupied bedroom was open. A curious grey light, not of dawn nor of moonshine, came out of it, and I looked in. The bed stood just opposite the door. A big four-poster hung with tapestry at the head. Then I saw that the greyish light of the bedroom came from the bed, or rather from what was on the bed, for it was covered with great caterpillars, a foot or more in length, which crawled over it. They were faintly luminous, and it was the light from them that showed me the room. Instead of the sucker feet of ordinary caterpillars, they had rows of pincers like crabs, and they moved by grasping what they lay on with their pincers, and then sliding their bodies forward. In colour these dreadful insects were yellowish-grey, and they were covered with irregular lumps and swellings. There must have been hundreds of them, for they formed a sort of writhing, crawling pyramid on the bed. Occasionally, one fell off onto the floor with a soft, fleshy thud, and though the floor was of hard concrete, it yielded to the pincer feet as if it had been putty, and, crawling back, the caterpillar would mount onto the bed again to rejoin its fearful companions. They appeared to have no faces, so to speak, but at one end of them there was a mouth that opened sideways in respiration. Then, as I looked, it seemed to me as if they all suddenly became conscious of my presence. All the mouths, at any rate, were turned in my direction, and next moment they began dropping off the bed with those soft, fleshy thuds onto the floor and wriggling towards me. For one second the paralysis of nightmare was on me, but the next I was running upstairs again to my room, and I remember feeling the cold of the marble steps on my bare feet. I rushed into my bedroom and slammed the door behind me, and then I was certainly wide awake now. I found myself standing by my bed with the sweat of terror pouring from me. The noise of the banged door still rang in my ears, but, as would have been more usual, if this had been mere nightmare... The terror that had been mine when I saw those foul beasts crawling about the bed or dropping softly onto the floor did not cease then. Awake now, if dreaming before, I did not at all recover from the horror of dream. It did not seem to me that I had dreamed. And until dawn I sat or stood, not daring to lie down, thinking that every rustle or movement that I heard was the approach of the caterpillars. To them and the claws that bit into the cement the wood of the door was child's play. Steel would not keep them out. 
But with the sweet and noble return of day, the horror vanished. The whisper of wind became benignant again. The nameless fear, whatever it was, was smoothed out and terrified me no longer. Dawn broke, hueless at first, then it grew dove-coloured, then the flaming pageant of light spread over the sky. The admirable rule of the house was that everybody had breakfast where and when he pleased, and in consequence it was not till lunchtime that I met any of the other members of our party, since I had breakfast on my balcony and wrote letters and other things till lunch. In fact, I got down to that meal rather late, after the other three had begun. Between my knife and fork there was a small pillbox of cardboard, and as I sat down, Ingle spoke. "'Do look at that,' he said, "'since you're interested in natural history. I found it crawling on my counterpane last night. I don't know what it is.' I think that before I opened the pillbox I expected something of the sort which I found in it. Inside it, anyhow, was a small caterpillar, greyish-yellow in colour, with curious bumps and excrescences on its rings. It was extremely active and hurried round the box this way and that. Its feet were unlike the feet of any caterpillar I ever saw. They were like the pincers of a crab. I looked and shut the lid down again. No, I, I, I don't know it, I said, but it looks rather unwholesome. Um, what are you going to do with it? Oh, I shall keep it, said Ingalls. It's begun to spin. I want to see what sort of a moth it turns into. I opened the box again and saw that these hurrying movements were indeed the beginning of the spinning of the web of its cocoon. Then Ingalls spoke again. It's got funny feet, too, he said. They're like crab's pincers. What's the Latin for crab? Oh, yes, cancer. So, in case it is unique, let's christen it, eh? Cancer Inglesensis. Then something happened in my brain, some momentary piecing together of all that I had seen or dreamed. Something in his words seemed to me to throw light on it all, and my own intense horror at the experience of the night before linked itself onto what he had just said. In effect, I took the box and threw it, caterpillar and all, out of the window. There was a gravel path just outside, and beyond it a fountain playing into a basin. The box fell onto the middle of this. Ingalls laughed. "'Ah, oh, so the students of the occult don't like solid facts,' he said. "'Ha! My poor caterpillar!' The talk went off again at once onto other subjects, and I've only given in detail as they happened these trivialities, in order to be sure myself that I've recorded everything that could have borne on occult subjects or on the subject of caterpillars. But at the moment when I threw the pillbox into the fountain, I lost my head. My only excuse is that, as is probably plain, the tenant of it was, in miniature, exactly what I had seen crowded onto the bed in the unoccupied room. And though this translation of those phantoms into flesh and blood, or whatever it is that caterpillars are made of, ought perhaps to have relieved the horror of the night, as a matter of fact it did nothing of the kind. It only made the crawling pyramid that covered the bed in the unoccupied room more hideously real. After lunch we spent a lazy hour or two strolling about the garden or sitting in the loggia, and it must have been about four o'clock when Stanley and I started off to bathe, down the path that led by the fountain into which I had thrown the pillbox. The water was shallow and clear, and at the bottom of it I saw its white remains. The soaking had disintegrated the cardboard, and it had become no more than a few strips and shreds of sodden paper. The centre of the fountain was a marble Italian cupid, which squirted the water out of a wineskin held under its arm, and crawling up its leg was the caterpillar. Strange and scarcely credible as it seemed, it must have survived, falling to bits of its prison, and made its way to shore, and there it was, out of arm's reach, weaving and waving this way and that as it evolved its cocoon. Then, as I looked at it, it seemed to me again that, like the caterpillar I had seen last night, 
It saw me, and, breaking out of the threads that surrounded it, it crawled down the marble leg of the cupid and began swimming like a snake across the water of the fountain towards me. It came with extraordinary speed. The fact of a caterpillar being able to swim was new to me, and in another moment was crawling up the marble lip of the basin. And just then Ingalls joined us. "'Why, if it isn't old Cancer Inglesensis again!' he said, catching sight of the beast. Ah, what a tearing hurry it's in! We were standing side by side on the path, and when the caterpillar had advanced to within about a yard of us, it stopped and began waving again, as if in doubt as to the direction in which it should go. Then it appeared to make up its mind, and crawled onto Ingle's shoe. Well, it likes me best, he said. I don't really know that I like it, and as it won't drown, I think perhaps. He shook it off his shoe onto the gravel path and trod on it. All the afternoon the air got heavier and heavier, with a sirocco that was without doubt coming up from the south, and that night again I went up to bed feeling very sleepy. But below my drowsiness, so to speak, there was the consciousness, stronger than before, that there was something wrong in the house, that something dangerous was close at hand. But I fell asleep at once, and how long after, I do not know, either woke or dreamed I awoke, feeling that I must get up at once, or I should be too late. Then, dreaming or awake, I lay and fought this fear, telling myself that I was but the prey of my own nerves, disordered by Sirocco or what not, and at the same time quite clearly knowing, in another part of my mind, so to speak, that every moment's delay added to the danger. At last this second feeling became irresistible, and I put on coat and trousers and went out of my room onto the landing. And then I saw that I had already delayed too long, and that I was now too late. The whole of the landing of the first floor below was invisible under the swarm of caterpillars that crawled there. The folding doors into the sitting-room from which opened the bedroom where I had seen them last night were shut, but they were squeezing through the cracks of it and dropping one by one through the keyhole, elongating themselves into mere string as they passed and growing fat and lumpy again on emerging. Some, as if exploring, were nosing about the steps into the passage at the end of which were Ingalls' rooms. Others were crawling on the lower steps of the staircase that led up to where I stood. The landing, however, was completely covered with them. I was cut off, and of the frozen horror that seized me when I saw that, I can give no idea in words. Then, at last, a general movement began to take place, and they grew thicker on the steps that led to Ingle's room. Gradually, like some hideous tide of flesh, they advanced along the passage, and I saw the foremost, visible by the pale grey luminousness that came from them, reach his door. Again and again I tried to shout and warn him in terror all the time that they should turn at the sound of my voice and mount my stair instead, but for all my efforts I felt that no sound came from my throat. They crawled along the hinge crack of his door, passing through as they had done before, and still I stood there making impotent efforts to shout to him, to bid him escape while there was time. At last the passage was completely empty. They had all gone, and at that moment I was conscious for the first time of the cold of the marble landing on which I stood barefooted. The dawn was just beginning to break in the eastern sky. Six months later, I met Mrs. Stanley in a country house in England. We talked on many subjects, and at last she said, I don't think I've seen you since I got that dreadful news about Arthur Ingalls a month ago. I haven't heard, said I. No, he's got cancer. They don't even advise an operation, for there's no hope of a cure. He is riddled with it, the doctors say. Now, during all these six months, I do not think a day had passed on which I had not in my mind the dreams, or whatever you like to call them, which I had seen in the Villa Cascana. It is awful, is it not? she continued, and I feel I can't help feeling that he may have caught it at the villa, I asked. 
She looked at me in blank surprise. Why do you say that? she asked. How did you know? Then she told me. In the unoccupied bedroom a year before, there had been a fatal case of cancer. She had, of course, taken the best advice, and had been told that the utmost dictates of prudence would be obeyed so long as she did not put anybody to sleep in the room, which had also been thoroughly disinfected and newly whitewashed and painted. But, A Tale of Terror by Thomas Hood The following story I had from the lips of a well-known aeronaut, and nearly in the same words. It was on one of my ascents from Vauxhall, and a gentleman of the name of Maver had engaged himself as a companion in my aerial excursion. But when the time came, his nerves failed him, and I looked vainly round for the person who was to occupy the vacant seat in the car. Having waited for him to the last possible moment, and the crowd in the gardens becoming impatient, I prepared to ascend alone, and the last cord that attached me to the earth was about to be cast off, when suddenly a strange gentleman pushed forward and volunteered to go up with me into the clouds. He pressed the request with so much earnestness that, having satisfied myself by a few questions of his respectability, and received his promise to submit in every point to my directions, I consented to receive him in lieu of the absentee, whereupon he stepped with evident eagerness and alacrity into the machine. In another minute we were rising above the trees, and in justice to my companion I must say that in all my experience no person at a first ascent had ever shown such perfect coolness and self-possession. The sudden rise of the machine, the novelty of the situation, the real and exaggerated dangers of the voyage, and the cheering of the spectators are apt to cause some trepidation, or at any rate excitement, in the boldest individuals, whereas the stranger was as composed and comfortable as if he'd been sitting quite at home in his own library chair. A bird could not have seemed more at ease, or more in its element, and yet he solemnly assured me upon his honour that he'd never been up before in his life. Instead of exhibiting any alarm at our great height from the earth, he evinced the liveliest pleasure whenever I emptied one of my bags of sand, and even once or twice urged me to part with more of the ballast. In the meantime the wind, which was very light, carried us gently along in a northeast direction, and the day being particularly bright and clear, we enjoyed a delightful bird's-eye view of the great metropolis and the surrounding country. My companion listened with great interest while I pointed out to him the various objects over which we passed, till I happened casually to observe that the balloon must be directly over Hoxton. My fellow traveller then, for the first time, betrayed some uneasiness, and anxiously inquired whether I thought he could be recognised by any one at our then distance from the earth. Well, it was, I told him, quite impossible. Nevertheless, he continued very uneasy, frequently repeating, I, "'I hope they don't see,' and entreating me earnestly to discharge more ballast. It then flashed upon me for the first time that his offer to ascend with me had been a whim of the moment, and that he feared uh, being seen at that perilous elevation by any member of his own family. I therefore asked him if he resided at Hoxton, to which he replied in the affirmative, urging again, and with great vehemence, the emptying of the remaining sandbags. Well, this, however, was out of the question, considering the altitude of the balloon, the course of the wind, and the proximity of the sea coast. But my comrade was deaf to these reasons. He insisted on going higher, and on my refusal to discharge more ballast, deliberately pulled off and threw his hat, coat, and waistcoat overboard. Hurrah! That lightened her, he shouted. But it's not enough yet. And he began unloosening his cravat. Oh, nonsense, said I. My good fellow, nobody can recognize you at this distance, even with a telescope. Oh, don't be too sure of that, he retorted rather simply. They've sharp eyes at Miles's. At where? At Miles's madhouse. Oh, gracious heaven, the truth flashed upon me in an instant. I was sitting in the frail car of a balloon at least a mile above the earth with a lunatic. 
the horrors of the situation for a minute seemed to deprive me of my own senses. A sudden freak of a distempered fancy, a transient fury, the slightest struggle might send us both at a moment's notice into eternity. In the meantime, the maniac, still repeating his insane cry of higher, 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 divested himself successively of every remaining article of clothing, throwing each portion as soon as taken off to the winds. The inutility of remonstrance, or rather the probability of its producing a fatal irritation, kept me silent during these operations. But judge of my terror when, having thrown his stockings overboard, I heard him say, "'Oh, we're not high enough yet. By ten thousand miles! One of us must throw out the other!' To describe my feelings at this speech is impossible. Not only the awfulness of my position, but its novelty conspired to bewilder me. For certainly no flight of imagination, no, not the wildest nightmare dream, had ever placed me in so desperate and forlorn a situation. It was horrible, horrible. Words, pleadings, remonstrances were useless, and resistance would be certain destruction. I had better have been unarmed in an American wilderness at the mercy of a savage Indian, and now, without daring to stir a hand in opposition, I saw the lunatic deliberately heave first one and then the other bag of ballast from the car, the balloon, of course, rising with proportionate rapidity. Up, up, up it soared to an altitude I had never even dared to contemplate. The earth was lost to my eyes, and nothing but the huge clouds rolled beneath us. The world was gone, I felt, forever. The maniac, however, was still dissatisfied with our ascent, and again began to mutter, "'Of your wife and children?' he asked abruptly. Prompted by a natural instinct, and with a pardonable deviation from truth, I replied that I was married, and had uh, fourteen young ones who depended on me for their bread. "'Ha! Ha! Ha!' laughed the maniac, with a sparkling of his eyes that chilled my very marrow. "'I have three hundred wives and five thousand children, and if the balloon had not been so heavy by carrying double, I should have been home to them by this time.' "'And uh, where do they live?' I asked, anxious to gain time by any question that first occurred to me. "'In the moon,' replied the maniac. "'And uh, when I've lightened the car, I shall be there in no time.' I heard no more, for suddenly approaching me, and throwing his arms round my body— That was classic tales of horror— read by Patrick Malahide. If you're having any difficulty obtaining any of our other titles or are unable to get to the shops, please write to us direct. Our address is on the inlay card with this tape. There is a list of some of our other titles on the reverse of your inlay card, but if you'd like an up-to-date catalogue, please send us a stamped addressed envelope and we shall be delighted to send you one by return. Thank you for listening to CSA Telltapes.